okay so i think i we can get started hi guys very good evening uh, time to get started for today and uh, the objective of today's session is to fine tune your reflexes with respect to the forthcoming exam because uh, when we study we tend to focus on mcqs of a particular subject whereas in the exam they could be like you know one question of anatomy one of pathology one then of medicine so we will have to jump from one subject to another that is one or in a in a mcq they can also be a possibility that more than one subject might be integrated as well so uh, that would be my objective you know to to ensure that you are mentally prepared to handle any kind of challenges like this so without much ado i think we can get started uh, okay okay uh, hi nias uh, dr gaming that's an interesting name akash uh, rudra venkat so good to see everybody and uh, i think we are good to go for the first question the objective would be primarily to ensure that you are fighting fit for the actual exam so till the last mcq of the exam is over there should be no celebrations and there should be no sadness present because especially after paper 1 in your exam there would be a lot of discussions with respect to that uh, okay this came in the exam or this did not come in the exam or this topic was more frequently asked and what happens is what i have usually seen is brilliant people tend to get uh, biased on basis of input from other people after paper 1 and therefore paper 2 because there's a waiting period of 2 hours so uh, that's where the bias uh, from other people negative energy from other people comes in and that can cause a downgrade of the scores so uh, i think we can uh, the audio visual part i think everybody is perfect ram ram uh, next ka year session maine kal kiya tha to aaj pura fmg exam center ka hai you know let's 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 get on with it hello pramod and dr samira so i have a smoker today uh, who has come to me with loin pain hematurian balo table mass on in the right flank by by manual palpation i mean jab bhi a word likha hota hai balo table mass in by manual palpation that means hum kidney ko test kar rahe hain so kidneys are basically retroperitoneal organs and uh, therefore uh, i mean the any every time you read this phrase no balo table mass on by manual palpation it's the kidney that is being talked about and anyway hi aman uh, the question says loin pain then he says hematuria so you can understand there is some pathology with the kidney and because he's mentioned a mass there also so obviously i am thinking in terms of a possibility of a renal cell cancer in this patient and then he says which of the following is going to be correct about this condition and also in the exam be careful regarding whether they going to incorporate uh, except word or not hi gorav uh, jai hind uh the question says uh, which of the following is correct and i have these four options before me i can get a c and a d present initially grows retrogradely into the renal artery leading to thrombosis uh read it carefully does it grow into the uh, can it grow actually i mean can a tumor grow inside an artery considering the fact that the artery would be having such a high pressure so there is a high possibility of embolization no the point is point is hi atul uh a lot of people mentioning c ध्यान से पढ़ो हाई राज द पॉइंट इज आई एम डूइंग गुड राज द पॉइंट इज इफ अ ट्यूमर इज ग्रोइंग इन द आर्टरी द चांसेस ऑफ एम्बोलाइजेशन विल बी रिलेटिवली मोर वेयर एज व्हाट वी फाइंड इज दैट द ट्यूमर टेंड्स टू गो इन द रीनल वेन एंड देन शोस अ हिमाटोजेनस डिसेमिनेशन सो द आंसर दैट इज गोना बी गिवन फॉर दिस क्वेश्चन इज नॉट सी अगेन अगेन प्लीज रीड केयरफुली गाइस आई एम स्टिल गेटिंग सी इन द फीड इन द एग्जाम बी पेशेंट टेक अ डीप ब्रेथ फोकस ऑन द ऑप्शंस ऑल ऑफ यू राइट रीनल सेल कार्सिनोमा तो इसका सवाल कभी गलत नहीं होना चाहिए फिनिक्स वेरी गुड इवनिंग इट सेज ग्रोज रेट्रोग्रेटली इन टू द रीनल आर्टर लीडिंग टू थ्रोमोसिस इट गोज इन टू द रीनल वेन यस इट कैन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू अ वेरिको सील बट द पॉइंट इज इन दिस एमसीक्यूट नॉट रिटर्न रीनल वेन इट इज सेइंग रीनल आर्टरी इफ इट वॉज रीनल वेन थ्रोमोसिस देन इट इज ओके that you could be having a pulmonary embolism or you could be having a uh, i mean uh, it it might result in uh, manifestations of a varicocele in a patient uh, yeah doctor you need to focus let's look at d papillary variant is seen with von heppel landau syndrome vhl is seen with chromosome uh, 3 defect and uh, the multiple tumors that are present here and the most common cancer of the kidney is the one that is associated with it so with von heppel landau guys the answer is again not d please read it very carefully it is papillary variant is seen with von heppel landau jabki milta kaun sa clear cell carcinoma to is question ka answer na to c hai na d hai c ka answer maine bola renal artery likha hai jabki vein hona chahiye matlab why it's wrong is because it's written renal artery 
and D because papillary variant D it is career cell carcinoma. There are multiple other tumors that can also be seen like uh, uh, CNS cerebellar hemangioblastoma. In fact, this is a question hai, while I am waiting for answer from your side because hemangioblastoma would be a tumor that would be originating not from the cells of the cerebellum but will be originating from a blood vessel related to the cerebellum. So cerebellar hemangioblastoma and then von Eppel and Dow is also associated with uh, PhD wala tumor, you all know PhD wala tumor is pheochromocytoma, which may palpitations, hypertension, or diaphoresis. Milta hai. If you look at B, originates from the distal converted tubule to galata, because it originates from the proximal converted tubule. Se. The correct answer for this particular question is option number A. And my request to you guys is that whenever you are studying pathology, I mean uh, systemic pathology has to be good, especially all the tumors, unki sari details are good. I mean, not only should you be knowing ki benign kaun sa, malignant kaun sa hai, you should be knowing the subtypes of it, association with chromosomes, association with genes and abhi time available hai. So in your own handwriting, you can write down the subtypes of every cancer, chai wo luck cancer hai, chai wo brain tumor hai, whether it's gonna be a, a cardiac tumor, you need to write down the histopathological names of each one of these, the genes and the chromosomes association. Yes, doctor, it will be available. Uh, pranam fly high. Uh, the, the logic uh, why A is the uh, answer to this question is because all other options have been ruled out. So, lot of questions in the exam will be solved on the basis of exclusion capability. Some questions are gonna be piece of cake. Aapko lagega yaar, iske liye main itna padhai kyo I mean, it's gonna be so easy that you're gonna read it and you will know the answer. But that would constitute only 30% of the paper. Then another 30 to 40 percent of the paper will be analytical capability, which is one I'm talking about at the moment. And 20 percent will be bouncer ki literally row do ge ki yaar, matlab, uh, ye topic matlab, mein apni mein kabhi nahi. That, that, that way. They deliberately put in those 20 percent to offset your rhythm, as I say, multiple times. But you guys are intelligent chaps, you will not get uh, uh, emotional because of that. You lot of guys get emotional because of that. Yaar, itna mushkil Aapne wo difficult sawal ko uh, solve karke aana hai ya usko chhod dena hai let it go and focus on the next one uh, it's like this ki line se five questions galat ho gayi you get five questions wrong on a line on a trot and still you do the sixth one correct and the seventh one correct that is all what mental toughness is all about hi rajat you can try out these questions which are present here i think these would be beneficial for you so another r into you know solving questions would me would be helping you out uh, answer to this question is option number A, B rule out here because it's going to originate from proximal tubule. It does not grow in the artery, it grows in the vein and with VHL it's going to be uh, a clear cell carcinoma. Hi Dr. Dev, Namaste. Starting with the second one for today, hand and foot syndrome with dactylitis would be seen with and I expect you guys to be able to answer this to me because this would be a, a, a partial repeat. Hi Dr. Uh, Dev, I have said you Namaste. Bola. <coughs> Yes, yes. Jai Hind bhi bola tha, kisi ne? Yep. Okay, so waiting for the inputs, guys. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Hand and foot syndrome with dactylitis is going to be encountered with which of the following scenarios? The options here are ranging from Coxsackie A and Coxsackie B, then is Capsetabine, then is sickle cell anemia. Okay, I'm having a predominant answer as, uh, okay, good, good, good. Now people are getting into the groove. I'm liking it. I'm liking that. I like that attitude. So let's get started. Uh, uh, the last answer that I could say was uh, A. So Coxsackie A virus would be seen with hand, foot and mouth disease. And this MCQ is not saying hand, foot and mouth disease. But this MCQ is saying hand and foot syndrome with dactylitis. I underlined the word dactylitis for your convenience also guys. Answer is not A. Because of the fact that Coxsackie A is seen with hand, foot, mouth disease where you would be having these vesicular lesions. And these vesicular lesions can be seen at the sites which are present. I mean, he can give you an image based question which he has done in the uh, previous years on the palms, on the soles, on the uh, on the face of a patient and even on the gingiva, that is where. And then we have another problem with this uh, question that is capsitabine infusion. Uh, we get hand and foot syndrome. But in this MCQ, it is written hand and foot syndrome with dactylitis, which is why the answer for this question is option number D. Yes, yes, guys. The correct answer for this question is option number D. Coxsackie B virus to hai sir, wo to Coxsackie B would be responsible mainly for causing, let me say, myocarditis. Coxsackie B can be responsible for development of type 1 diabetes mellitus in a patient. It can cause development of fulminant diabetes. So when you read the data, I think uh, it would be 
uh, pretty straightforward. Option number A is going to be related to hand, foot and mouth disease. Option number C is hand and foot syndrome. And the alternative name for this hand and foot syndrome or he can give you an image based question also. He can say that patient is being given chemotherapy, 5 fluorouracil or the patient is going to be given the drug that is given for this particular question that is capsitabine. Uh, so with this again they, there is redness in the palms in the soles of the patient. So either he can write the word palmoplantar dysesthesias. There is going to be extreme amount of redness present. There is going to be even if you touch the soles of this patient he will say that it is going to be hurting. So palmoplantar dysesthesias is again hand and foot syndrome. So first I put up images here just to sensitize you to this fact that if they give a chemotherapy situation to you and then they ask you the presentation it is hand and foot syndrome. If you are able to pick up these vesicular lesions then it's obviously going to be hand foot and mouth disease which is a pediatrics MCQ of the previous FMG exam and what I did was introduce this hand and foot syndrome again from pathology because of the fact that there is going to be dactylitis present there. So considering the fact that the short bones are involved that's where the answer is sickle cell anemia. Hota kya hai? Okay, abhi, I'll try to do that. Sickle cell anemia mein jo RBCs hote hai, wo zyada, uh, uh, rigid ho jate hai and they are also becoming relatively more sticky. The problem in sickle cell anemia is that there sticky red blood cells hote or because sticky red blood cells are so the branching points of chota chota blood vessels are gonna get occluded because of which the blood supply to the bones can be hampered. You see, after all, sickle cell anemia is not only about anemia, but it is also about sickling crisis. As somebody put very rightly, Niaz put that word, RBC sequestration. There is gonna be a sickling crisis developing in a patient. Or if blood supply is hampered, it's gonna contribute to avascular necrosis of the bones. Most of the time it is the avascular necrosis of the small bones of the hand that would be developing because of which there would be extreme pain in a child with sickle cell anemia to the level that this child will become opioid dependent. Yes guys, in sickle cell anemia there is a severe, I mean autosponectomy to hota hai by the third year of life you start having a autosponectomy in a patient but the initial clinical manifestation of these patients is gonna be presence of fever Along with this fever, there is going to be development of multiple episodes of severe bone pain, especially with respect to the small bones of the hand. That is why the word dactylitis would come up. That is the pain would be occurring mainly with respect to the bones of the hands and the feet. Along with this, subsequently, you would start having features like abdominal crisis because the blood supply of the uh, intestine can be hampered. So the child will be requiring repeated hospitalization with acute abdomen. And you will notice that in the first three years of life of this patient, there will be a splenomegaly. If they give you a sickle cell anemia question in the first three years of life, there would be a splenomegaly. But then there would be repeated splenic infarction episodes. And therefore, ultimately, these patients will develop by the third birthday or later, the same patient will end up with development of autosponectomy. Uh, well, uh, just uh, comment in the chat box uh, for me. Is splenic infarction painful or painless? The question is, Splenic infarction, is it going to be painful? Yes, Niaz, it will also cause acute chest syndrome. Before we come to acute chest syndrome, just let me know whether the, the, the splenic infarction that will be occurring in the patient, would it be painful or would it be painless? Quickly, guys, you can just quickly comment in the chat box and we can go ahead. Yes, uh, waiting for a couple of comments. See, I'll put it like this. The point is, just am I painful, that's he. Okay, that is what I was waiting for. Painless BR, painful BR. Guys, painful hoga because I have said abdominal crisis. Yeah, abdominal crisis kyo hota hai? because the blood supply of the spleen will be affected. The child will be having a splenic, splenic infarction and splenic infarction will be horribly painful. It will just look like pain of uh, initially you might be thinking the pain is due to acute pancreatitis. It is not painless guys. That is the point I want to tell you. Am I just painful? Hota hai, toh, splenic infarction be painful. Hoga. Any organ ka blood supply chala jai, it's gonna be horrible, horribly painful. Hanji, darad hota hai, darad hota hai, right? So, splenic infarction will occur. This will cause the child to become uh, admitted in the hospital with a misdiagnosis of acute abdomen due to pancreatitis or any other cause that you might be thinking. Most of the time in kid, you would think in terms of pancreatitis only. So, these children require repeated hospitalizations and because of which they tend to become opioid dependent and the worst is yet to come. Abhi maine worst ki to baat hi nahi kari hai. 
इस बच्चे को चेस्ट पेन के एपिसोड होंगे सो यू कुड ऑल्सो बी हैविंग एक्यूट चेस्ट सिंड्रोम डेवलपिंग इन अ पेशेंट चेस्ट पेन के नकर एंड बिकॉज ऑफ द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ पलमरी आर्टरी इन्फॉक्शन because of development of pulmonary artery sequestration of rbcs even pulmonary artery hypertension can develop in these patients so sickle cell anemia guys is gonna be uh, sickle cell anemia is beyond anemia matlab anemia to hota hi hai lekin wo aapko ye sare aspects puch sakta hai jo maine yahan par discuss kiye from the clinical perspective and the most important thing is hand and foot syndrome word padke seedha ऑप्शन नंबर ए पे मार्क मत करना बिकॉज ऑफ द रीजन आई हैव एक्सप्लेन टू यू दैट इज हैंड फुट एंड माउथ डिजीज तो बहुत सारे सिली मिस्टेक्स होते हैं एग्जाम में जिनको हमें अवॉइड करना है एंड या आई थिंक वेल डॉक्टर देर आर नो शॉर्टकट आई कैन से बट एट द सेम टाइम माई सजेशन वुड बी दैट जितना आप ज्यादा एम सी क्यूज करोगे एट द मोमेंट इन द मोर एम सी क्यू डिस्कशन यू वन लिसन टू द मोर अबिलिटी यू विल बी हैविंग to exclude options in the final exam so isko loop pe laga do you know the the live sessions ko uh, and keep on listening to them uh hydroxyurea is given for ya yeah, increasing the count of hemoglobin f so that the sickle sickle part will not contribute to so much of problems for the patient uh mandar it would not be acute coronary syndrome it would be acute chest syndrome in a patient because acute coronary syndrome uh, acute coronary syndrome is uh, a presentation with atherosclerosis is there a specific treatment for anemia no uh, just like in thalassemia you have to give packed rbcs to the patient moving to the third question for today what is the leading cause of seeding of the peritoneal cavity which leads to malignant ascites in a patient well has a gynecological overlap and yep i think most of the guys are going to be correct in this case that uh, the leading cause for malignant ascites in a patient would be ovarian cancer the correct answer for question number 3 is option number b and now i put up a question to you guys what would be causing a malignant pleural effusion just like you have correctly answered malignant ascites is with ovarian cancer let me know what would be the leading reason for development of a uh, malignant pleural effusion and i will correct those people who are answering c you are pseudo myxoma peritonei jo hai this would be a tumor that causes ye to ye to basically this tumor will be having mucin like material This tumor can develop in either the ovary or can develop in the appendix. Or in this, it will be mucinous material. Hoga, so it can burst, and there would be a spillover of uh, there would be a spillover of mucinous mucin mucin rich material in the peritoneal cavity because it's a mucin rich material present in the peritoneal cavity. So we call it pseudo myxoma peritonei. This is usually a tumor that can originate. The tumor ka naam hoga mucinous cyst adenoma. that can be originating in the appendix of the patient yes it's it can arise in the appendix of the patient okay so i did not get my answer for malignant pleural effusion guys malignant pleural effusion would be answered with lung cancer that is adenocarcinoma the adenocarcinoma the lung is a peripheral lung cancer to peripheral lung cancer pleura ko irritate karta rahega and the irritation of the pleura would ultimately result in a malignant pleural effusion in a patient the bottom line is we'll just quickly revise this once again there are two questions that have discussed with respect to serous cavity effusions by serous cavity effusion i mean patient could be having a malignant ascites or a person could be having is a malignant pleural effusion slash a hydrothorax and malignant ascites would commonly be seen with ovarian cancer and uh, malignant pleural effusion would be seen with lung cancer uh, just uh, for my satisfaction please uh, answer for me uh, which is the commonest ovarian cancer i'm getting a stomach cancer as an answer here also so let's we'll solve that also yes guys uh, please let me know malignant ascites is seen with ovarian cancer which is the commonest ovarian cancer jaise lung cancer humne baat kari adenocarcinoma of the lung is responsible yes guys malignant ascites please ovarian cancer ब्रेस्ट कैंसर कैन कॉज अ या कैन कॉज अ मेलिग्नेंट बट ब्रेस्ट कैंसर यूजली मेटास्टाइज करके हार्ट में जाएगा या ब्रेन में जाएगा ना मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम तो इट कैन कॉज अ मेलिग्नेंट पेरिकार्डियल इफ्यूजन हाँ जी इपिथीलियल बताओ नहीं टेराटोमा तो नहीं है सर इट्स नॉट डरमोइड सिस्ट मेलिग्नेंट अभी तक तो मुझे एक भी सही इपिथीलियल में सर वरायटी बताओ ना यस 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 सीरस सिस्ट अडिनोकारसिनोमा तो आपका जो आंसर होगा द क्वेश्चन आई पुट अप वॉज that which is the commonest ovarian tumor from histopathological subtype and your answer would be it is a serous sir serous cyst adenoma nahi it is serous cyst adenocarcinoma tumor mein galti nahi karni hai yaar i mean 
you are not supposed to make any mistakes with respect to any tumors in pathology it is a serous cyst adenocarcinoma which is the commonest ovarian tumor and it is adenocarcinoma of the lung with respect to malignant pleural effusion in a patient with respect to pseudomyxoma peritonei most of the time the tumor will be originating in the appendix this tumor will be rich in uh, mucin ye burst kar jayega it will spill over into the peritoneal cavity and that is where pseudomyxoma peritonei would develop and for carcinoma stomach the but bo uh, the bottom line is that carcinoma stomach will cause drop down metastasis this drop down metastasis would be called as krokenberg tumor so a and b were anyway not the answers to this question a and uh, c were not answers to this question anyway because you know stomach cancer results in krokenberg and pseudomyxoma peritonite is related to a ventricular tumor or can be an ovarian also so the leading one is carcinoma ovary assisted you know carcinoma that can cause a malignant ascites in a patient some people were mentioning regarding meek syndrome so meek syndrome jo hota is it due to a benign tumor or a malignant tumor meek syndrome is due to a benign tumor or a malignant tumor yes guys sister mary joseph haan ji wo amlicus mein jayega chodo usko meek syndrome ko batao mujhe haan ji it would be a benign tumor that would be a fibroma fibroma ke sath mein ascites hota hai aur ascites ke sath mein right sided pleural effusion hota hai आपका पेशेंट पढ़ा लिखा है एजुकेटेड है आपसे पूछ रहा है कि डॉक्टर साहब वो पेट में पानी भर गया साइटिस तो वो लंग्स में कैसे चला गया इज देर अ कम्युनिकेशन बिटवीन द प्लेरिटोनियल कैविटी एंड द प्लूरल कैविटी यस गाइस साइटिस हुआ उसको वो समझ में आ गया बिकॉज द ट्यूमर विल इरिटेट द पेरिटोनियल पेरिटोनियम सो पेरिटोनियल फ्लूड एक्यूमुलेट हो गया साइटिस वाई डू हैव राइट साइडेड प्लूरल इफ्यूजन लेफ्ट साइडेड क्यों नहीं होता है यहाँ पे और पानी चला कैसे गया पेशेंट इज सर हाउ डिड द फ्लूड गो फ्रॉम द पेरिटोनियल कैविटी टू द प्लूरल प्लूरल कैविटी इज देर अ कम्युनिकेशन सर हमारे डायफ्राम में फेनेस्ट्रेशन होते हैं ड्यू टू दो फेनेस्ट्रेशन द फ्लूड कैन मूव अक्रॉस फ्रॉम द असाइटिक दैट इज फ्रॉम द पेरिटोनियल कैविटी टू द प्लूरल कैविटी तो असाइटिस वाले जिसको असाइटिस है उसको हाइड्रोथोरैक्स भी हो सकता है ये रूटीन से ही बात है कि चाहे किसी को लिवर सिरोसिस की वजह से साइटिस हो जाए इवन दो स्टेप्स कैन बी हैविंग अ प्लूरल एफ्यूजन बिकॉज द पेरिटोनल कैविटी एंड द प्लूरल कैविटी वुड बी कम्युनिकेटेड कम्युनिकेटिंग वाया फेनेस्ट्रेशन विच आर प्रेजेंट इन द डायफ्राम सो यू कैन बी हैविंग इज अ प्लूरल एफ्यूजन एंड मोस्ट ऑफ दीज फेनेस्ट्रेशन आर ऑन द राइट एंड साइड सो बिकॉज ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट द फेनेस्ट्रेशन आर ऑन द राइट एंड साइड प्रमारली यू टेन टू गैव अ राइट साइडेड प्लूरल एफ्यूजन इन दिस केस द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस क्वेश्चन इज ऑप्शन नंबर बी एंड I got relative less correct answers for this one, so I think that the systemic pathology part should be as good as the general pathology component. Let's do the next one, the fourth one for today. Which of the following is the most common CNS tumor in a AIDS positive patient? Because AIDS positive patients can be having a development of Kaposi sarcoma, uh, which anyway is not the answer to this question because Kaposi sarcoma will be mainly located on the extremities of the patient. the commonest location of kaposi sarcoma will be on the legs it's a vascular tumor so it can bleed at any point of time it can be on obviously it can be present anywhere in the body i mean it can be present even in the oral cavity it can be in the liver it can be in the spleen of the patient but then uh, this vascular tumor kaposi sarcoma is due to hhv8 it is seen with aids but the causative agent is hhv8 is saying which of the following cns tumor is present the correct answer is lymphoma uh, the most common cns tumor in a aids positive patient would be a lymphoma kaun si variety ka hodgkins ya non hodgkins mujhe multiple inputs mil rahe hain jo ki incorrect hai aapko aids defining tumor aane chahiye which have been asked in the previous fmg exam which variety of lymphoma guys हॉचकिस होगा नॉन हॉचकिस होगा द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर द क्वेश्चन इज ऑप्शन नंबर सी इट्स अ नॉन हॉचकिन तो नहीं होता सर इट्स अ नॉन हॉचकिन लिफोमा रिलेटेड टू द ब्रेन व्हिच इज गोना बी प्रेजेंट उसकी जो सब टाइप होती है वो भी पूछी हुई आपके एग्जाम में ई सेड विच वराइटी ऑफ लिफोमा वुड बी सीन इन एड्स पॉजिटिव पेशेंट सो इट वुड बी इम्यूनोब्लास्टिक सब टाइप ऑफ डी एल बी सी एल दैट इज डिफ्यूज लार्ज बी सल लिफोमा then aids defining tumor are invasive cervical carcinoma apart from invasive cervical carcinoma any more you can tell me aids defining tumor guys 
somebody answered correctly for AIDS defining tumors that is invasive cervical carcinoma lymphoma would be non Hodgkin's primary CNS lymphoma exactly that is the word I was looking for primary CNS lymphoma PCNSL likhega aur fir uski variety puchega PCNS ki subtype hoti hai DLBCL uski bhi subtype puchhe hai immuno pura yaad karna immunoblastic subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the primary CNS lymphoma of AIDS so we have invasive cervical carcinoma and then we have Kaposi sarcoma so there are three AIDS defining tumors and in the previous years in the exam he had asked it as all except where the fourth option was multoma I'll just write it for the sake of completion all except karke usme puchha tha so three tumors are the ones which are mentioned here multoma was the answer multoma obviously is gonna be seen with helicobacter pylori this is also a non Hodgkin's lymphoma please comment in the chat box multoma is a B cell tumor B for Bombay T for tiger B or T bolne mein kai bar you know hearing that might cause a bit of confusion so that's why please chat in the comment box Bombay or tiger or you can type B or uh, T also whatever is, is, is okay by you yes guys yes guys multoma is gonna be a non Hodgkin's lymphoma that's gonna be encountered in the stomach it's a tumor that may not occur if the infection was eradicated this would be a B cell tumor again it's a B cell tumor sir it's a B cell tumor okay so I'm getting mixed responses at this point of time I think it must know MCQ for you guys is AIDS defining tumors which I've explained to you I mean three and four sir kabhi galat nahi ho raha in three the minimum information expected to remember is malignant effusion that is malignant ascites and malignant pleural effusion two must know questions for you that should never go wrong and since we had multiple inputs in this case we are just gonna invite uh, we, we are gonna just put one more slide into this non Hodgkin's lymphoma ki most common variety bata dena mere ko Hodgkin's ki mein likhi raho Hodgkin's ki mujhe pata hai aap mujhe bata doge global basis pe bhi aur indian perspective pe bhi to mein wo aap se nahi puch raho मेरा क्वेश्चन आपसे नॉन हॉजकिन लिफोमा की मोस्ट कॉमन जो आई मीन सब टाइप होती है उसका नाम बताइएगा मुझे कॉमनेस्ट वराइटी ऑफ नॉन हॉजकिन लिफोमा क्विकली गाइस लेट्स जस्ट गेट ओवर विद इट अदर्स दैट आर आक्स्ट हेयर आर बर्किट्स लिफोमा देन इज यस द लीडिंग वन इज दैट इज द क्वेश्चन दैट आई आक्स्ट डिफ्यूज लार्ज बी सेल लिफोमा इज द मोस्ट कॉमन नॉन हॉजकिन लिफोमा In pediatric age group, they would love to hear regarding the Burkitt's lymphoma part. That's the B cell varieties that they love to hear or love to ask about. Then is multoma. Another one that they ask is lymphoplasma cytic lymphoma. I know for Hodgkin's lymphoma, you guys will be able to answer. So you will notice that in the previous sessions in the exam, he is more focusing on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as compared to Hodgkin's lymphoma in a patient. Yeah, follicular lymphoma, that's another subtype that they love to ask. But this is overall the commonest one. Burkitt's lymphoma anyway is a relatively easier one that we are familiar with. In Burkitt's lymphoma, he will ask you regarding chromosomal swaps. The chromosomal swaps all will be having 8 number present. That is 2, 8, 8, 14. A mere liye tisra wala 8 batana. Multoma is with H. pylori. Question manager jo poochha uska answer dena mujhe. Which is the third 8 wala T swab which are missing at this point of time. And lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma is seen with which virus that causes viral hepatitis. Two MCQs to be mentioned quickly. Chromosomal swab for Burkitt's lymphoma the one that is missing. 2.8 is done. 8.14 is done. There is one more that is missing that you need to tell me. Yes it would be 8.22. So there are three of them that are the swabs which are present. Tell me which virus that causes viral hepatitis is responsible also for causing lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma. Yes, A22 is done. Great, great. Let's move on. Lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma is seen with which virus? This would be hepatitis C virus. Somebody mentioned uh, a miscellaneous aspect. So I'll clear that also. STLV1 is the one which has been asked in your exam for T cell, adult T cell leukemia. That adult T-cell leukemia is the one where you would be able to see these immature cells in the circulation which are also called as flower cells. So a miscellaneous aspect which is to be remembered is STLV1 results in adult T-cell leukemia. I just saw STLV1 written in the chat so I thought I'll just dedicate another few seconds into writing the manifestations which have been asked for STLV1 
in your exam in the previous years it is tropical spastic paraparesis a relatively rare disorder but still asked and then is adult T cell leukemia which has again been asked with respect to the flower cells no sir cesare cells are different cesare cells are with respect to this the T cell tumor that is going to be seen with non hodgkins lymphoma because non hodgkins will be b cell and t cell now the t cell variety is the one where you read about cesare cells where you have clover leaf cells present that is mycosis fungoides which is also written as cutaneous t cell lymphoma and this cutaneous t cell lymphoma is the one which can disseminate from the skin to the lymph nodes and that is why it's referred to as a cesare syndrome subsequently that's where we get clover leaf pattern present so uh, i think as far as uh, non hodgkins lymphoma is concerned there is more data which is to be studied for hodgkins as such uh, i don't think so that you'll be having any uh, issues present because uh, uh, most of the information would be relatively straightforward one for the global version for the indian variety or the classical reed stun bug cells are seen with respect to the indian variety that is the mixed cellularity variety yeah porteous microbes are seen with mycosis fungoides so my suggestion is guys for lymphoma both varieties read up uh, listen to uh, the discussion given in the medicine component also that will just let you know whether your pathology component is good enough or not so uh, we are sorted for question number 3 the correct answer for this one was option number b and uh, yeah <laughs> doc panther i'll try to incorporate that fourth again we are sorted that the most common cns tumor in a aids positive patient uh, is uh, going to be a primary cns lymphoma and we move on to the fifth one for today uh, that is human papilloma virus can be resulting in development of which of the following i rule out a couple of options for you multoma we can rule out it seen with helicobacter pylori yes so i'm waiting for answers yeah we'll do a doc we doing it integrated we'll just push things gradually yes niaz is the only one who has answered so i'm still waiting for other comments there okay post transplant lymphoma option number b is seen with epstein barr virus so cannot be the answer T cell lymphoma. I've already told you the answer would be STLV1. So I think everybody can comment on the correct answer in this case. Human papilloma virus can result in uh, even a development of oropharyngeal cancer. It can result in development of even laryngeal cancer. The correct answer for this one is option number C. Post transplant lymphoma guys is seen with Epstein Barr virus. And post transplant graft failure is seen with cytomegalovirus. if graft failure will occur due to cytomegalovirus they will give you microscopic finding of renal tubular cells and inside this renal tubular cells you will be able to see basophilic inclusions these basophilic inclusions will be present in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm and these blue color inclusions that are present in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm are referred to as owl eye inclusions so lots of time i mean you would be getting question with respect to a person underwent a kidney transplantation after the transplantation the serum creatinine is rising so the doctor was concerned about the fact that there is a rising serum creatinine and he has advised regarding uh, a urine microscopic examination though ideally we can diagnose cmv infection on the basis of pcr or i can do antibody profile but just to make it very cliche he can ask you regarding owl eye inclusions in the renal tubular cell ye jo cell dikh raha hai ye renal tubular cell hai it's a damaged renal tubular cell jisme blue color ke intracytoplasmic और ब्लू कलर के इंट्रा न्यूक्लियर बोथ बेजो बोथ इंट्रा न्यूक्लियर एज वेल एज इंट्रा साइटोप्लाज्मिक इंक्लूजन वुड बी प्रेजेंट सो दैट्स पिटी स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड ट्रेडिशनली वी रीड विद रिस्पेक्ट टू आउल आई अपियरेंस विद रिस्पेक्ट टू रीड स्टन बक्स एल ऑन लिम्फ लोड बायोप्सी सो दैट वो तो आपको आता ही है सो आई डिड नॉट आस्क दैट दैट आउल आई अपियरेंस विद रिस्पेक्ट टू रीड स्टन बक्स एल ऑन अ लिम्फ लोड बायोप्सी इन अ पेशेंट सो दैट वुड नॉट बी एन इशू and with respect to and yeah uh, most uh, post kidney transplantation abhi has asked epstein barr virus or cytomegalovirus so two alag alag questions hai. if the question says post transplantation failure if he says the word failure then you have to think in terms of if he says the word failure it is cytomegalovirus if he says post transplantation lymphoma then it is epstein barr virus in a patient 
Anyway, I mean, the correct answer for us is human papilloma virus. It can result in oropharyngeal cancer as well. Absolutely correct. So we can move on to the next one. Fifth, I think I got a good response as compared to the previous ones. And this question says, which of the following is a site of activation of the B lymphocytes? So relatively an easier one again. Do pick up that word activation of the B lymphocytes. Blue, yes, it would be basophilic. Cytomegalovirus would always be bluish in appearance. Yeah. Yes, guys, the site of activation of the B lymphocytes. Waiting for the comments in this case. Malt ki usual site kya hoti hai, wo main mention kar dato. Mycosa associated lymphoid tumor. Uh, tumor is a separate issue, but malt is ileum basically. Pears patches which are present. Okay, I'm getting A as an answer that is uh, bone marrow. So bone marrow say mature B cells release hote hai, but wo activate nahi hote hai. I think guys you're missing out the answer. It is activation of the B lymphocytes. Activation of the B lymphocytes occurs in secondary lymphoid organs. The answer is not A. The answer is not A. Please read the question carefully. Aapko lag raha hai ki ji bahut asaan hai. There will be some tricks involved in the question. He says where is the activation we have mature b cells coming from the bone marrow that's okay but where do they get activated where do get converted where do they do the hunting that is in the lymph nodes of the patient and in the spleen of the patient the correct answer for question number six is bombay it is activation of the b lymphocytes that occurs in the secondary lymphoid organs the two less secondary important lymphoid organs are the lymph node and the spleen of the patient because here are follicles in the spleen there are follicles in the lymph node there are germinal follicles so what are the germinal follicles in the germinal follicles? they are activated, they are doing their training they have been growing for 18 years like the child is 18 years old, you are sending them out of the house then you will go to college, you will take professional training, then you will become a doctor so when the lymph node is mature, you have to remove it from the bone marrow and you have to go and say that you will go आप तो स्पेशलाइज्ड प्रोफेशनल ट्रेनिंग लेके किलिंग कैसे करनी है? सो दैट प्रोफेशनल ट्रेनिंग इज़ व्हाट इज़ रिसीविंग इज़ इन द लिम्फ नोड्स एंड इन द एंड इन द एंड इन द स्प्रीन ऑफ़ द पेशेंट। द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस वन इज़ बॉम्बे सर थाइमस तो इज़ रिलेटेड टू टी लिम्फोसाइट नो सो एनीवे दैट वु T cell का एक्टिवेशन वुड अगेन बी द लिम्फ नोड्स सर एक्टिवेशन ट्रेनिंग जो होती है वो लिम्फ नोड्स में ही होती है। द एक्टिवेशन बोथ B cell एंड T cell की जो एक्टिवेशन है दैट अकर्स इन द लिम्फ नोड्स ऑफ द पेशेंट। द करेक्ट आंसर टू क्वेश्चन नंबर 6 इज बॉम्बे माय रिक्वेस्ट इज जस्ट रीड द क्वेश्चन केयरफुली द क्वेश्चन वाज नॉट वेयर द बी सेल्स आर रिलीज्ड फ्रॉम द क्वेश्चन वाज द एक्टिवेशन मूविंग टू द नेक्स्ट वन कॉम्प्लीमेंट सिस्टम वुड बी एक्टिवेटेड बाय व्हिच कंपोनेंट ऑफ द एंटीबॉडी स्ट्रक्चर ही इज टॉक्ड अबाउट लाइट चेन हेवी चेन एफसी सेगमेंट एंड एफएबी सेगमेंट एंड लेट्स लुक एट व्हाट यू गाइस हैव टू से रिगार्डिंग दिस वन यस गाइस यू हैव टू बी क्विक these are pathology because we still need to do medicine based one so i'll talk about a uh, ecg based scenario subsequently but before that let's let's just look at it the complement system is activated by which component of the antibody structure hum aise matlab antibody ko draw karte hain na to uska ek fab component hota hai aur ek uska fc component hota hai jo fab hota hai wo antigen binding karta hai to fab to iska answer hoga nahi तो दूसरा वाला जो साइड होती है उसका नाम क्या होता है एफ सी वाला साइड होता है द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस वन इज ऑप्शन नंबर सी अ फैक्ट बेस्ट क्वेश्चन दैट द कॉम्प्लीमेंट सिस्टम इज एक्टिवेटेड बाय विच कॉम्पोनेंट बी वी ऑलवेज रीड अबाउट कॉम्प्लीमेंट कॉम्प्लीमेंट मीडिएटेड वास्कुलाइटिस सो द एंटीबॉडीज आर कॉजिंग दैस्कुलाइटिस बाय द एफ सी कॉम्पोनेंट एंड एफ सी में uh, मुझे बताओ यार ये सी से क्या मतलब हो गया वॉट वुड सी स्टैंड फॉर दैट F तो फ्रैगमेंट हो गया वो तो इजी है F इस फ्रैगमेंट A B इस एंटीजन बाइंडिंग साइट व्हाट डस C स्टैंड फॉर गाइस यस अ सिंपल वन लाइनर क्वेश्चन F C कंपोनेंट ऑफ एंटीबॉडी में C का मतलब क्या है गूगल मत करना गूगल करें बिना बताना व्हाट डस C स्टैंड फॉर यस यस व्हाट डस C स्टैंड फॉर constant okay 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 so we have a constant part which is written as fragment crystallizable it's the fc component which is the constant component agreed i mean the constant component is also written as crystallizable component i mean constant is a relatively no it's not a constant chain doctor we have a variable chain and we have a uh, i mean we have a variable part and a heavy chain component present 
it is the constant part which is more appropriate so constant is okay i still buy that in the mcq we will write the word crystallizable so it's fragment crystallizable the constant component at the antigen binding site and it is the fc segment which is going to be responsible for the activation of the complement system the entire alternate complement pathway and uh, then the direct complement pathway is the one which is to be studied very very thoroughly no it's not carboxy terminal sir it is fragment crystallizable okay so constant part i'm agreeing to it's it's the c1 q part of the uh, complement system that will activate and then the whole cycle gets activated and we have formation of membrane attack complex that would be c5 to c9 and that would ultimately cause death of whatever is the infectious agent and anyway you have to read about antibodies also but uh, nowadays those questions like which is the antibody which is a pentameric antibody oh sorry question thode purane ho gaye aap dekhoge ki they are very less likely to be asked like in earlier times you used to ask like which antibody is the one which is most commonly seen in the blood it is obviously immunoglobulin g but still i mean just for my satisfaction mention kar dena yahan par ki uh, which antibody is uh, called as the first line of defense in the body just start क्लिशे टाइप ऑफ क्वेश्चन ये डिटेल्स आपको आती हैं दैट दीज आर आई डोंट नीड टू फोकस ऑन ब्लैक पैंथर आपको अपना यूट्यूब बंद करना है और बंद करके फिर से ऑन करना है और अपनी वीडियो की रेजोल्यूशन सेटिंग चेंज करनी है वो ऑटो पे होगा ऑटो से हाई रेजोल्यूशन पे जाना है इंटरनेट सेविंग मोड भी पूछेगा वो तो सेटिंग चेंज करना यू विल गेट टू अ बेटर रेजोल्यूशन हाँ जी मेरे एंड पे नहीं है सर आपके एंड पे यस का इज विच इज द एंटीबॉडी which is the antibody which is going to be responsible ttp versus itp versus hus sir maine na ttp ke video mein bataya hua hai vinith so try to do it from there i'll try to okay do justice to it the antibody the first line of defense would be answered as immunoglobulin a this is the mucosal antibody and happens to be the first line of defense ओके द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस वन इज नॉट इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन एम सर जी क्या कर रहे हो फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस इज नॉट इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन एम द फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस इज इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन जी इट इज इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन सॉरी इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन ए व्हिच इज द फर्स्ट म्यूकोजल इम्यूनिटी यार किसी को खांसी जो काम है और वो आपके ऊपर खांस रहा है आपका रूममेट है और वो आपके मुंह पे खांस रहा है शेमलेसली होता ना बाय वी स्टे इन अ हॉस्टल और रूममेट मुंह पे खांस रहा है तो बहुत बार यू मे नॉट कैच अ कोल्ड ही मैट बी हैविंग अ कोल्ड यू आर नॉट कैचिंग अ कोल्ड व्हाट इज प्रिवेंटिंग यू फ्रॉम कैचिंग द कोल्ड इज योर गुड मिकोजल इम्यूनिटी योर इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन ए इज गोन बी फाइटिंग देयर सो इट्स इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन ए व्हिच इज द फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस डॉक आई थिंक इट विल बी प्रोडक्टिव डॉक्टर विप फॉर्म राम राम नवरंग एंड लेट्स मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट वन नो डॉक्टर गेमिंग इट्स नॉट इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन जी द फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस इज इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन ए ओके जी लेट्स मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट वन this is a smoker who presents with exacerbation of purulent bronchorrhea so that tells me he is suffering from copd the chap is suffering from chronic bronchitis that's the first line telling me smoker with purulent bronchorrhea shortness of breath but then the question also says that the chap is having tuberculosis in the past and took att for 6 months so he's had some damage in his lungs by tuberculosis and the chest x ray of this patient is showing linear shadows in the basal lung fields what is trying to tell me is that this particular chap has had lung damage he might be a cigarette smoker he might be having a chronic bronchitis but then subsequently he is having linear shadows in the lung fields which are what are called as a tram track appearance this will entirely change the entire perspective because in the first line of the mcq he was trying to distract me he was talking about a smoker presenting with purulent bronchorrhea so okay i mean he is talking about a chronic bronchitis patient but because is the guy has suffered from tb which is common in our country and then there is a radiological evidence that is also present the moment we read about tram track appearance we know that the damage in the lung would be bronchiectasis and with respect to tb the manifestation is called as bronchiectasis sicca the correct answer for this particular question is option number b see the point is initial presentation of this chap i understand is chronic bronchitis because he is talking about purulent bronchorrhea shortness of breath in a smoker who is 40 years of age but then he is giving me a radiological evidence he is telling me of a past history of structural damage to the lungs so we need to take that into consideration that there has been more damage to the lungs of this patient by a infective pathology that is pulmonary tuberculosis which is why the answer for this question would be given as uh, uh, option number b 
विष्णु मैंने ना ये जो क्वेश्चन है ना इसमें आपका कंफ्यूजन है कि सिलिकोसिस आंसर करें या एसबेस्टोसिस आंसर करें तो आप इसको प्रीवियस ईयर के रिकॉल में देखना मैंने सॉल्व किया हुआ है उसमें कि द क्वेश्चन वॉज विद रिस्पेक्ट टू अ पर्सन हु इज वर्किंग विद रिस्पेक्ट टू अ स्टोन इंडस्ट्री then is ending up with development of ground glass appearance so occupation was mentioned and apart from that is mentioned lymph nodes we do not get lymph nodes in asbestosis okay let's move on to the next question and if i manage the sawal pucha wo to beech mein reh gaya the correct answer to the current question that i put up before you is option number b bronchiectasis sicca because tuberculosis mein usually lung secretions both limited ho jate hain so initially he might be having this bronchorea lekin baad mein the lung secretions would be relatively scanty so we call it bronchiectasis sicca the correct answer for this one is option number b yes uh, my division doc that is the perfect statement because there was a stone worker he had a lymphadenopathy and there is presentation there is a lymphadenopathy present in a patient then it is silicosis then it's okay that's what i'm trying to tell you okay ji moving to the next one 70 year old man suffered from severe chest pain the chap is having a st elevation on the ecg pink frothy sputum with bilateral crepitations and died in the emergency room before the thrombolysis of the patient could be started the post mortem specimen of the patient is shown so you can see that uh, there is a dye leakage which has occurred there is a staining which is ye jo white wala area ye to old damage ka hai this is the fibrosis so he might have had an mi earlier in the posterior wall but in the anterior wall there is a a uh, dead area which implies that there was a infarction present and the question says that the patient has died before the treatment could be done now if a person is having pink frothy sputum if a person is having bilateral crepitations that means the heart muscle is not working sir agar wo cardiac tamponade hota agar wo cardiac tamponade hota pehli baat to mi ke baad mein to tamponade bataye hi nahi tamponade ki maine jo situations aapko batayi hain wo to badi unlikely hai ki मोस्टली आपको बताए ट्रॉमा के बाद में टेम्पर होता है ट्यूबर क्लोजेस की वजह से हो सकता है इनफैक्ट टीबी से ज्यादा कॉमन जो क्वेश्चन देगा आपको दैट वुड बी विद रिस्पेक्ट टू मेटास्टिस ही विल से मेलेगनेंट पेरिकार्डियल एफ्यूजन इन अ पेशेंट और इट कुड बी विद रिस्पेक्ट टू ट्यूबर क्लोजेस इन अ पेशेंट तो एम तो यार बड़ा अनलाइकली है कि एम में हार्ट बर्स कर जाए और कार्डियक टेम्पर हो जाए इफ इज मैंशनिंग पलमरी एडिमा इन अ पेशेंट दैट मीन्स हार्ट इज नॉट वर्किंग इट इज अ हार्ट फेलियर दैट इज डेवलपिंग इन दिस पेशेंट द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस वुड बी पंप फेलियर बाई अल्टीमेटली इज गॉन इन टू कार्डियोजेनिक शॉक मयोकार्डियम इज डैमेज नो ए मयोकार्डियम इज डैमेज द पर्सन विल गो इन टू कार्डियोजेनिक शॉक एंड विल रिजल्ट इन डेथ इन द पेशेंट कार्डियक रपच्चर तो सर बड़ी रेयर कॉम्प्लीकेशन होती है मयोकार्डियल इन्फॉक्शन की मतलब आपने कभी ऐसा सुना यूजली रूटीन में आपने सुना है कि किसी को एम आई हुआ उसका हार्ट ही बर्स्ट कर गया Like a balloon, I mean heart has substantial amount of muscle. No, heart has substantial amount of muscle. So to have a myocardial infarction, which is so extensive that it will burst the heart of the patient like a balloon and cause a cardiac rupture slash a tamponade, is very very unlikely. Plus, there was evidence also given in the question. He is mentioning regarding pink frothy sputum. He is talking about crepitations in the chest. That means the moment you read this, your आपके माइंड में as a doctor word आना चाहिए भाई heart failure हो गया. अगर हार्ट फेलियर हो जाएगा दैट मीन्स पंप फेलियर इन अ पेशेंट एंड स्पीड बॉल इज स्टिल सेइंग कि कार्डेक रप्चर तो सर कार्डेक रप्चर इज अ कॉम्प्लिकेशन एमआई में पढ़ना इट अकर्स आफ्टर द थर्ड एंड द फोर्थ डे इट अकर्स आफ्टर ट्रांसम्यूरल मेयोकार्डल इन्फेक्शन एंड इट टेक्स सम टाइम फॉर द कार्डेक मसल टू यू नो गिव अवे एंड बर्स्ट इट इज ऐसा हो ही नहीं सकता कि इतना थिक मसल है एंड इट्स गोना बर्स्ट इमीजिएटली सो कार्डेक रप्चर इज अ वेरी कॉमन चीज है सोचो ना सर हार्ट किसी को एम होगा तो एम से क्या होगा उसको या तो एरिदमिया होंगे अगर किसी को मयोकार्डियल इन्फेक्शन हुआ तो कॉमनली डेथ क्यों होती है तो या तो वो एरिदमिया हो जाते हैं वो टैकेरिदमिया हो सकते हैं जैसे कि वेंट्रिकुलर फेबरेशन हो गया वेंट्रिकुलर टैकेकार्डिया हो गया अब अगर मैं वीटी या वीफे पूछता आपसे तो वो तो प्योर हार्डकोर जनरल मेडिसिन का डेटा हो जाता आई एव एक्सटेड फ्रॉम प्योर पैथोलॉजिकल परस्पेक्टिव that why a person of mi can die so there are two primary reasons he can die either it is a arrhythmia or it is a heart failure in a patient so that is why the answer to this question is option number c pehle common cheezon ke bare mein sochna hai pehle rare cheezon ke bare mein nahi sochna hai its common differentials which are to be thought of initially plus the scenarios for cardiac tamper are told trauma malignancy tuberculosis and very rarely myocardial infarction so we are sorted for question number 9 and we can move on to the 10th one uh let's uh, learn regarding 
inflammatory bowel disease because he has talked about sulfur salazine anema in a patient. He says a patient who is 40 years of age has come to my hospital today. The chap is having recurrent episodes of bloody diarrhea uh, for one year. He is on steroid and a sulfur salazine anema. So the way the question is framed, it is telling me that the person is having ulcerative colitis or he, he could be having, uh, uh, I mean I can just say broadly inflammatory bubble disease. He has developed skin lesions which are painful to touch. Dressler syndrome is a late complication of MI which is 6 months later and Dressler is not death. Nahi hoti. Dressler is a post MI pericarditis so it does not cause death in a patient. Yes guys. He is talking about skin manifestations in inflammatory bubble disease. He is talking about extra intestinal manifestations in patients of inflammatory bubble disease. I will rule out a couple of options for you. Dermatitis herpetiformis is going to be seen with celiac sprue, so it can be ruled out. Necrobysis lipidoica diabeticorum is seen with diabetes mellitus, so it can be ruled out. So we are left within two options, pyoderma gangrenosum and erythema nodosum. Because it is purplish lesions, and these purplish lesions are painful also. They are present on the legs of a person of inflammatory bubble disease. The diagnosis of this patient would be kept as erythema nodosum. We will not answer it as pyoderma gangrenosum because if it was pyoderma gangrenosum, he would have given me an image of an ulcer. If they give you a question on a patient who is having inflammatory bubble disease and this chap with inflammatory bubble disease is having a presence of an ulcer which is present on the shin of a patient, that is when you will think it, think it would be an ulcer which would be having a violet or a, or a, I can say a purplish discoloration of skin around it. If they give you an image based question in which there is going to be an ulcer on the shin of a person of inflammatory bubble disease, it will have a violet discoloration around it. That is when you will think in terms of uh, pyoderma gangrenosum. Otherwise, if we are not going to be having an ulcer present, if we are just going to be having nodules present, then we are going to think in terms of inflammatory bubble disease. Okay doc, I will try to speak in English only. Uh, it's painful purplish lesions on the shin of a person, a chap having inflammatory bubble disease. We have to think in terms of erythema nodosum in this particular case. And in the previous years in the exam, they have given an ulcer, ulcer with respect to the one on the shin, which is one which could be answered with respect to inflammatory bubble disease. So Marjolin's ulcer is what you see with respect to Burns patients. Uh, they, where they can be a development of a squamous cell cancer. Absolutely Navrang, you are spot on for that, that in pyoderma gangrenosum an active ulcer would be shown. Curling ulcer is with respect to burns and I don't think so that you need to worry about it. So next up is a very straightforward question. The key word is arborizing fern pattern and uh, yes the video will be available later as well. But it's good to join right now because you are going to keep, you are going to compete with other people and see whether they are answering and you are not. Arborizing fern pattern implies, I mean, uh, I put up an image here to show, I mean, what do you mean by the word arborizing fern pattern? Uh, it's just like patte, right? I'll just use a Hindi word, patta would mean leaves, right? The way they would spread out on, on a tree. Similarly, we can see stroma, we can see some connective tissue. I'll just highlight the connective tissue here, and that's like a stalk, and then you have these fronds or fern, pe uh, fern petals uh, of fern leaves that are present. So we can see a clear cut uh, uh, connective tissue connected tissue core I can see in the polyp and the correct diagnosis on this keyword as I think the pathologist has taught you very well is Peutz Jagger syndrome. This would be related to STK11 mutation. This is uh, going to be presence of hamartomatous polyps. Hamartomatous would mean that there would be some connective tissue support present. Traditionally polyp is all about connective tissue. Polyp is all about epithelium. Uh, traditionally polyp is all about epithelium minus connective tissue but in this particular case you can see some connective tissue support in between and then those fronts or fern like pattern is present and the most common site for these hematomatous polyps is the jejunum. The bad news about a patient of Peutz-Jagger syndrome is that not only would they be having cosmetic problems by cosmetic problems I mean that they could be having these blackish lesions on their lips and above these lips they could be having these uh, mucosal melanosis so that's a cosmetic problem but apart from these increased incidence of cancer can be seen in these patients. You could be having increased incidence of hepatobiliary cancer. You could be having increased incidence of pancreatic cholera, pancreatic uh, cancer in these patients. So we can be having, uh, Sir Concord Canada is given already in uh, uh, and is a less common topic. So we'll not focus on less common topics. It's given in the notes. So let's not focus on, let's talk about the common things here. 
one would be a cosmetic issue and second would be increased incidence of cancer that would be hepatobiliary cancer increased incidence of uh, pancreatic cancer would be seen in these patients the pdf for this would be available in the telegram group and the telegram group is uh, link is present in the description of the video below it is uh, uh, mucosal melanosis would mean black spots around the lips and even or around the perineal uh, uh, skin of the patient okay guys so we are sorted for this one relatively a easier one for familial adenomatous polyposis i'll just mis put on some miscellaneous data without asking you guys because that will take up more time apc gene chromosome number 11 and these patients would be having at least more than 100 polyps in the colon and because you would be having so many polyps in the colon therefore patients of diagnosed with familial adenomatous polyposis would be told that you need to go in for a prophylactic uh, colectomy these patients should be told to go in for a prophylactic colectomy before their 40th birthday in fact in some books they mention even before their 30th birthday to prevent the chances of development of adenocarcinoma of the lung uh, adenocarcinoma of the uh, intestine in this patient okay i'll try some english sessions also okay so we sorted for uh, question number 11 let's move on to 12 more of uh, medicine plus pathology he says which of the following is going to be correct with respect to type 2 diabetes velitis in a patient where we have uh, reason for type 2 diabetes velitis is defective genes you have receptor resistance but in the exam they asked what is the reason by development of receptor malfunction i mean the receptors are okay at birth but they start misbehaving at 40s or 50 years of life so why is it that we are having a receptor resistance in type 2 diabetes mellitus is due to defective genes the second aspect is that in patients of type 2 diabetes you could be having an insulinopenia yes guys even in type 2 diabetes in the late stages the beta cells get destroyed you get insulinopenia not only in type 1 diabetes mellitus but we get insulinopenia even in type 2 diabetes mellitus why that happens that the beta cells get destroyed in type 1 diabetes is autoimmune that everybody knows but why is it that we have destruction of beta cells in type 2 is because of deposition of amyloid protein a lot of guys have got it spot on the real problem in type 2 diabetes mellitus in the late stages would be that patient will stop responding to oral hypoglycemic drugs why is it that they start res stop responding to oral hypoglycemic drugs is because they start de developing insulinopenia that is when you need to use insulin in type 2 diabetes in type 2 diabetes initially it is a receptor malfunction but in the later part of the illness in the same patient you are going to be having a insulinopenia that's because of the amyloid protein deposition which will cause destruction of the beta cells in the patient i got multiple answers there let me look at a beta cell mass reduction due to destruction of cells by autoimmunity guys this would be answer for type 1 diabetes mellitus a is going to be valid for type 1 diabetes in b the problem is it is written receptor up regulation it should be a receptor down regulation it should be receptor resistance in fact the technical word would be receptor resistance if there is an up regulation i'll get a better response to insulin you see if you just go by english here if you're going to have a receptor up regulation you're going to have a better response so you cannot say b as well you cannot say a because that would be type 1 diabetes and beta cell increment is the problem in option number d so even if you were trying to solve this question by exclusion you would still would narrow down to the diagnosis or the answer so try a large number of questions you know i want you to maybe at the end of it go back scroll back in the video listen to it at 2x and check out how many of these did you get correct compete with yourself not with others how many others got correct just check out how many did you get correct because otherwise what we have to do is do a self evaluation just be a better version of yourself every single day that's the point so try to do 30 40 questions 50 questions every day because exam is around the corner i know you're trying to build up your theory but over and above building up the theory component you also need to build up your mcq capability skills yep guys i think uh, uh, the iapp uh, uh, the islet associated amyloid protein iaap the statement is perfectly fine ishrat what you said is islet associated amyloid protein spot on let's move on to the next one we are having a patient is type 2 diabetes mellitus is hp1c is 10 percent we asked him to take insulin i mean we know, you know the fact that in type 2 diabetes mellitus if hp1c of the patient is more than 10 percent 
that person should be equal to or more than 10 then we should be starting the patient directly on insulin and if a type 2 diabetes mellitus patient hb1c is between 8 to 10 percent then we should be starting the patient on oral hypoglycemic agents yes guys a lot of these patients are not going to follow your advice and you know they can die so he's saying why would they die and the leading cause of mortality would be cardiac issues this is a repeat question which has been asked in your exam multiple times it is enhanced cardiovascular mortality in diabetics they can even have a silent myocardial infarction but in your exam he has not got into the details of silent myocardial infarction it is cardiovascular mortality is the leading reason for death guys we do get a kidney failure in type 2 diabetes mellitus i agree to that but the main reason for death in these patients even if the kidney is involved if kidney is damaged the damage to the kidney will result in decreased gfr it will still cause hypertension the hypertension will damage the heart it will cause left ventricular hypertrophy left ventricular hypertrophy will cause increase in oxygen consumption in the heart increase oxygen consumption is still going to cause angina and chest pain in a patient and anybody who having myocardial ischemia can die due to most of the time arrhythmias or ischemia can contribute if not a arrhythmia it can cause heart failure and the person can die so the leading cause of mortality in diabetes mellitus is cardiovascular mortality if he just says what is overall the most common complication of diabetes mellitus then the answer will change so just for my satisfaction please comment in the chat box what is overall the most common complication of diabetes mellitus yeah stunned myocardium is a technical term for myocardial infarction occurring yes guys what is the leading uh, complication of diabetes mellitus yeah black squad i got your point i think that's a gaming id that you made okay i initially read some squad so i thought death squad or something like that yes guys most common complication of diabetes mellitus is nephropathy retinopathy neuropathy come on guys bromocriptin helpful no sir i don't think so that you should be going ahead with bromocriptin yes it would be neuropathy which is the commonest complication overall with respect to 50% of patients would be having is a neuropathy and most of the time it would be a small fiber neuropathy when i say small fiber neuropathy it means that unmyelinated c fibers are the ones which would be involved in these patients it's unmyelinated c fibers which would be involved which will cause a uh, pain in the soles of the foot discomfort in the sole of the foot touching the sole of the foot will cause perception of pain that is allodynia so most diabetics would come to you with a neuropathy and the leading reason why they would be dying is a uh, nrc b mortality dyslipidemia results in uh, coronary artery disease yeah it's one of the reasons why these patients can die okay guys let's move on to the next one for today and is a repeat from your exam the kid was having recurrent sore throats we had was a hyaluronidase antibody and he says what is going to be the complication that would be developing in this particular patient uh thank you dr modi for the kind words the options are kawasaki disease where we have coronary artery vasculitis so i am ruling out one of the options for you guys because coronary artery vasculitis uh, usually the age of presentation of kawasaki would be relatively younger i mean most of the time the child with kawasaki will be 4 to 5 years of age then there is going to be that you know mucocutaneous lymph node manifestations there is going to be strawberry tongue given in a question so since it is not given that would not be the answer to this question kawasaki i think everybody could rule out Uh, cystic fibrosis also everybody could rule out because in cystic fibrosis the presentation would be that of recurrent pneumonias and along with recurrent pneumonias there would also be malabsorption syndrome developing in a patient so if you are having a combination of recurrent pneumonia and malabsorption that's when cystic fibrosis is to be considered i am getting a predominant c in the question guys in rheumatic fever people are saying c in rheumatic fever you have aso antibody you have aso titer to be elevated read the question what is it written it is anti hyaluronidase antibody the anti hyaluronidase antibody is the alternative terminology for anti dna ace antibody this anti dna ace antibody is going to be responsible for post streptococcal glomerulonephritis and what is the presentation of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis it's going to be presentation of hematuria i honestly did not expect this to go wrong let me make you practice this now and i expect that after my explanation you are going to be 100% ready to solve it 
every time you get a question on recurrent sore throats you always have to keep two possibilities possibility number two is an example of type 2 hypersensitivity reaction that is rheumatic fever second is example of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction which is gonna be post streptococcal glomerulonephritis which is written as post infectious glomerulonephritis for rheumatic fever it is ASO antibody for PSGN slash PIAGN the antibody is anti DNA ACE antibody which is also written as anti hair luronidase antibody and uh, with respect to uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis you may not be having a recurrent sore throats you might even be having is a skin infection after skin like it's rainy season nowadays so the sweat will evaporate with difficulty so lots of time in India people will end up people who are I mean low socioeconomic patients would end up with development of pustules on the skin that pustules on the skin is pyoderma and that pyoderma can result in development of post infectious glomerulonephritis so it is you need to focus there I mean you know it requires humility to even acknowledge that it is wrong. You know, normally it will happen that I will hide it from you. I will try to hide it, you know, if I make a mistake. But then it's humility, good. If you acknowledge it, at least you won't make a mistake like this. Subsequently, the correct answer for this one is option number B. It is anti-hyaluronid is antibody present. So don't solve the question on sore throat, you know. You have to, how do you diagnose a case? Do you diagnose on basis of symptoms? Or is you, do you go on basis of evidence-based medicine? Please comment in the chat box. Do you go in for symptoms, signs, or do you go for evidence-based medicine? Evidence-based means laboratory tests. Patient to roega, doctor sabit ne sare test likte hain. You are supposed to write so many tests, right? Because you need to be sure and protect yourself medical legally also. So what is gonna be what is gonna be required? It's evidence-based medicine. It's not symptoms and symptoms and signs matter, no doubt about it. But then it's gonna be evidence-based medicine that matters. Answer to 14 is Bombay. Let's move on to the 15th one. This lady has presented with complaints of headache and feeling lost for one year. You know, feeling lost for one year. So not loss actually. This would be lost here. Which is a very vague symptom. It basically means that she is being, okay, she is being threatened that it is depression. She is being treated for depression. Sorry for the errors there. This lady, she is being treated for depression. She is uh, having headache, she is feeling lost, she is being treated for depression and last night she had a GTCS episode and then we did a CT scan in this patient. So, GT in 150, there is 99. So, okay, I don't want to party, I mean, okay, I will take it, I will take 99, I will take 120. Okay, he is saying uh, what is the image present here, so you can see a uh, lesion, it is ill defined white. So white kya hota hai? White kya hota hai? White is either a bleeding. So bleeding ki history to nahi hogi one year mein. So it could be a calcification. Bleeding of such a large amount will cause death of a patient in next few hours. So one you can see white kya hota hai? White is either gonna be on a, on a MRI or on a CT. The white is either gonna be bleeding or it's gonna be a calcification. So I'm taking it to be a calcification. Or phir iski tail bhi hai. So considering the fact that a tail be present or a ill-defined mass present, ill-defined mass present, we have to focus on common things. If this abscess is there, then there should be a fluid level. If this abscess is there, then abscess may most of the time there would be a fluid level that would be present. That is one. And fluid level ke saath mein, there should also be a contrast enhancement present. Abscess is inflammatory. So most of the time, if there is gonna be a abscess present. Then the abscess will also be having a contrast enhancement which means that you will be able to see some evidence of vasogenic cerebral edema ki iske aspas aapko grayish area dikhai dega jabki isme aapko grayish area nahi dikhai de raha it's a well circumscribed mass present there. So I agree brain abscess can be a possibility but brain abscess one year se ho bada unlikely hai yaar. I am ruling out brain infarction because infarction will result in black appearance in a present black appearance on a on a on a on a neuro imaging you have to think in terms of common things and the common thing is a brain tumor every time there is a long standing history in a patient and especially given the clinical domain there is a headache which could indicate raise icp and there is irritation of the brain which is causing gtcs considering the two facts together 
and more importantly i could mention a tail which is also present here that is dural tail sign which is present the diagnosis of this patient is to be kept as meningioma the correct answer for this question is option number c i can straight away rule out brain infarction why because brain infarction will be producing a lesion that's going to be black i can rule out brain abscess on the basis of the fact that brain abscess will not be having a history of one year brain abscess will be having high grade fever chills rigors patient can be septic or sepsis could trigger development of brain abscess in a patient so brain abscess it always will be having a short history apart from short history there would be high grade fever there would be chills in a patient whereas in our case there is no fever there is no chills or rather it is gtcs which is a feature suggestive of a intracranial space of occupying lesion in this case sir pehli baat to cyst jo hoga na wo andar se empty hoga the cyst would be liquid liquid will again be black cyst kaise rule out karenge to liquid ka jo andar wala area hoga wo black hoga na to pehli baat to yahi hai ki the the part is cyst is going to be uh, i mean uh, even if a, if even if it's a craniopharyngioma which is a cystic tumor it has a calcification the inside of that the periphery is white and the inside of that is black sir excision all brain tumors will require a stereotactic brain surgery not a conventional brain surgery a stereotactic brain surgery would be required for these patients to remove the intracranial space occupying lesion let's move on to the 16th one okay which is the most common brain tumor guys quickly which is most common brain tumor overall what is the overall most common primary malignant brain tumor yes and the benign one so now bit of session attend karo most common brain tumor is going to be metastasis glioma nahi bolna hai yaar that's a primary malignant brain tumor the most common brain tumor is mets wo mets kahan se aate hain so the mets are going to come from either the lungs that is oat cell cancer or the mets are going to come from breast or it's going to be or it's going to be a malignant melanoma mar is for malignant mal malignant melanoma these are three tumors that can have a high propensity of metastasizing to the brain the primary malignant brain tumor is going to be a glioma benign cancer meningioma hota meningioma is the one which has a tail present so that is why the radiological link was present a dural tail sign and this is the only brain tumor that has evidence of intracranial calcification only brain tumor having intracranial calcification is going to be a meningioma comment in the chat box what is the investigation choice for brain tumor options are plain ct contrast ct plain mri contrast mri I repeat the options once again what is the best test for diagnosis of brain tumor plain ct yeah glioma grade 4 that's okay plain ct a contrast ct plain mri contrast mri waiting for answers here for the heart mets are common but then the primary tumor will change obviously for the primary tumor it's not going to be a glioma the primary tumor of the heart will be answered by you as uh, rhabdomyosarcoma yep the best way for diagnosis of a brain tumor is a contrast based mri it is not a ct scan sir you guys study radiology so much to phir to galat hone nahi chahiye plain ct kaise sir plain ct kyu nahi karenge because there would be cerebral edema present vasogenic cerebral edema so gadolinium enhanced mri gadolinium enhanced mri is the investigation of choice for diagnosis of a brain tumor it is not a prognosis of a meningioma sir any brain tumor if detected early we can still be having a good prognosis if it starts causing gtcs the chances of mortality in a patient would dramatically increase it's a contrast mri your technical answer would be a gadolinium enhanced mri okay let's like look up uh, question number 16 this patient has tested positive for mycobacterium tuberi on uh, cbnat cartridge based nucleic acid amplification technology It did not come to the hospital despite multiple reminders. Standard problem with our patients: the way mil jati hai free me, to firwa na chhod dete. Today has come up with massive amoxicillin. 
He says, what are you going to be doing in this particular patient? Okay, great, great. That's the objective, sir. We'll try to solve other questions also. So let's look at your answers, guys. Uh, we are having a patient who's having TB. This tuberculosis has resulted in a cavity formation in the lung. The cavity is causing erosion of an artery. Most of the time, the artery that will be eroded is bronchial artery. That is itself a question. Which artery would be eroded? That is bronchial artery. And because of the bronchial artery erosion, there would be a massive hemoptysis in a patient. He is saying, what is the main treatment for this chap? So, because he is bleeding, I need to plug the bleed. We will do an interventional procedure in this patient that we will do angiography and first find which blood vessel branch is bleeding, bronchial artery branches, whichever is bleeding and then we will inject a, inject a gel into the bleeder and if you inject the gel into the bleeder, what it will do is it will control the bleed present. So the best management for this guy would be a bronchial artery embolization. The main way to diagnose this patient's source of bleeding is to do angiography and then go in for a gel embolization. That's a bronchial artery embolization is the treatment of choice for this patient. You can easily rule out a flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy because massive hemoptysis are so the camera will get lost in the blood. We have to do a CT scan for evaluation of whether the cavity is in the left or whether the cavity is in the right. So if the question said that what investigation would I be doing in this patient? Yeah, I can be doing a CT angiography in this patient or I can be doing a conventional angiography and then manage this patient. So to find where the cavity is left side, right side, then I can do a CT angio or we can do a I mean, if I don't have an angio, uh, uh, I do, even if I don't give the contrast because the person is bleeding and I don't want to waste time, I do a plain quick CT and then do our intervention of angiography, conventional angiography and handle this patient. Uh, the question was saying best step for the management of this patient. He did not say the next step for the management of the patient. The best way would be to save the life. The PDF would be available in the Telegram group. The link for the same is in the description of the video but just going through the pdf would not matter so go through the discussion at 2x 1.5 whatever you feel comfortable and uh, you would be able to uh, learn a lot of facts beyond simply doing the answer to the questions yep uh, what which of the following is useful for evaluating sorry sky appearance of burkitt's lymphoma we are having an afro-american kid today and is presented with a jaw swelling and uh, you have uh, the pathologist has given a storisca appearance on the report uh, yes uh, guys okay okay so medicine revision will be doing sir subsequently at the moment we're taking it a little easier for today which would be useful for picking up the storisca appearance it obviously will be a biopsy sir it's not a flow cytometry flow cytometry with the number like you they are this is cd13 CD14, ऐसे CD13-14 जैसे अगर लिखा है, तो this would be for myeloid leukemia. On the other hand, if it's flow cytometric markers which are described, like he's saying CD10, that is kala, or he's talking about uh, others like CD21, then I mean you know CD10 for example or CD2, that's for T cell leukemia. So that is where you will have to think in terms of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So this appearance is on a biopsy. The correct answer to this question is a needle biopsy. You send it to the pathologist. That is where a Stariska appearance is present. And uh, we are at the moment uh, uh, not talking about flow cytometry or immunophenotyping in a patient. Neither talking about a gene array which can be useful for, for example, a chronic myeloid leukemia. The question was a simple pathology based question. Ki Stariska appearance milta kahan pe hai? So it is seen with respect to a lymph node biopsy. It would be a lymph node biopsy. Or nobody will diagnose it on the basis of this. We will be able to demonstrate chromosomal swaps and be able to identify the patient. Yep, the question is not for how do you diagnose a Burkitt's lymphoma. That's okay when you start answering immunophenotyping. He's saying what is used to identify a, a starry sky appearance. That would be a lymph node biopsy in a patient. Sir, FNSC is different from a lymph node biopsy. We're going in for a proper excision biopsy. We're taking multiple sections of the lymph node. Because if you add a needle, the needle may miss the core of the tumor. The needle might be put superficial. So you might miss the tumor. So it is a excision lymph node biopsy. You remove the lymph node, send it to the pathologist. They'll make multiple sections of it. And that is when you'll be able to identify uh, the tumor present. The correct answer for this one is option number D. We move on to the 18th, 18th one. Uh, child is having a pitting pedal edema and a periorbital edema. 
he says which of the following is the least likely etiology responsible for it the keyword is there is a pitting edema so i've already sensitized you to this so yes guys uh, pitting pedal edema and a uh, sir flow cytometry the cd part would always be given no uh yeah neurocystic cirrhosis on a ct scan now that would be a totally different ball game not for toxoplasmosis uh, toxoplasmosis would be having a basal ganglia involvement yes guys waiting for answers in this case the correct answer for this one would be yes lakshmi has come up with the correct answer straightforward filariasis because filariasis would be having is a non pitting edema so this was relatively i think one of the easiest ones that i have put up before you because all other will be causing a pitting edema that you will press with your thumb on the dorsum of the foot of the patient or you will press with the thumb on the medial malleolus of the patient and it will produce a gadda or a depression so minimal chain disease nephrotic syndrome has a pitting edema cirrhosis because albumin is lesser every time on cortic pressure will decrease it will produce a pitting edema dilated cardiomyopathy will cause volume overloading i mean congestive heart failure usually the trigger can be a pressure or a volume based overload so when i'm saying volume overload there would be a pitting pedal edema but filariasis would be a non pitting edema present the answer to this is c we move to the 19th one which of the following is the leading complication of atherosclerosis of the abdominal aorta i mean uh, because uh, there is a fibrous cap present here uh, there would be a lipid core i mean atherosclerosis has two layers inside is the lipid core that's where the fat is present and over the lipid core we have a cap present that's a fibrous cap and the fibrous cap can rupture at any point of time resulting in emboli which are going to be present okay least likely miss kar diya so least likely miss nahi karna hai okay not a problem what uh, good you make mistakes here you won't make them in the exam yes guys which of the following is the leading complication that would be seen with respect to atherosclerosis if there is going to be atherosclerotic involvement of the abdominal aorta it will result in a aneurysm formation the correct answer for this one is option number beta i mean uh, though we can be having aortic dissection but main reason for aortic dissection is undiagnosed uncontrolled hypertension and fibromuscular dysplasia is lesion that is red with respect to renal artery stenosis only then is cystic medial necrosis that is again one of the reasons which is responsible for development of uh, 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 hypertension and renal artery stenosis so i mean the question was anyway with not with respect to uh, renal artery stenosis or hypertension the question was simply he could it to likh diya na abdominal aorta ki involvement hai to it will cause weakening of the abdominal aorta and causes a aneurysm formation this aneurysm can burst also in fact you are aware of the fact that abdominal aorta aneurysm if the size of this would be more than 5.5 cm then it can exhibit a spontaneous rupture and the patient will become pulseless please read about abdominal aorta aneurysm uh, interventions endovascular interventions even from surgery as well uh, you guys can comment with respect to what is the investigation choice for abdominal aorta aneurysm atherosclerosis is causing weakening of the wall of the aorta and therefore there is a aneurysm formation uh, no sir you should a uh, 2x loop would become too much uh, dr prajwal and uh, that would be a big problematic considering that we have very less number of days left for the exam so i think the rr component will give you that fighting fighting chance so that 30 hour thing is a better option okay i am getting a ct i'm getting a transthoracic echocardiography uh, the question is not with respect to aortic dissection the answers that i'm getting at the moment are for aortic dissection in aortic dissection we can be going in for a transthoracic echocardiography if the patient is hemodynamically unstable for aortic dissection we can be going in for a ct angiography where we get that uh, tennis ball appearance i think a lot of you are mixing it up with aortic dissection the question is not on aortic dissection i said how do you identify abdominal aorta aneurysm so okay so uh, okay people are saying ct angio so uh, let me give you two options ct angio or mr angio which is better for soft tissue doppler is for peripheral peripheral artery involvement every time you have aneurysm in the peripheral circulation if you are having narrowing of artery in peripheral circulation that is when doppler would be done ultrasound for aneurysm okay fine accepted so options are ultrasound doppler ct angio mr angio can i have the answers now soft tissue and ir so it's a mr angio that would be the best way to identify it so for uh, identifying a 
uh, abdominal aorta aneurysm, we can be doing a MR angiography in a patient. I mean, we can be doing a MR angiography here also. It's not that uh, we can only need to do a CT angiography. It's a, it's an MR angiography as well. The same finding a tennis ball would be seen. The point is, every time you're scanning the aorta, soft tissues have to be evaluated. So, uh, MR would always be superior as compared to a CT. It's only that CT is more easily available in hospitals. That is why I wrote CT angiography. It's that it's it's readily available. It's fast. Uh, MRI will take relatively more time considering hemodynamic instability. So, I wrote CT there. But the point is, wherever possible, I mean, it's it's a MRA superior for soft tissue issues. Okay, G, fine. So, uh, we are sorted for question number 19. Answer is Bombay. And let's move on to the 20th one. We are having a bilaterally enlarged kidneys in a patient. And he's also having a 2 gram per gram of urinary creatinine a proteinuria. So, considering that uh, this particular chap is having a proteinuria of this particular magnitude, it implies the fact that uh, the patient is suffering from, yes guys, yes sir, we are giving contrast, no, we are giving IV contrast in a patient. All subjects are to be done, sir, like you have to do one day, may one subject completed, no, try to do and Padna say you have to go through your notes, fatafat, fatafat in 6 to 8 hours and the remaining 6 to 8 hours, uh, whatever time you are having, you can listen to RR or you can do multiple choice questions on the, that particular day. So, if you are studying for 7 hours, you have to go through the RR component video and the remaining 7 hours, you have to go through your notes. Uh, and if you want to do your notes with RR, that's okay by me and the remaining time into MCQ. So, it's one day per subject and you have to finish it. Okay. Ji. Or shortcuts, it's not 12 subjects, 13 subjects, it's all subjects to be done. Yes, guys, which of the following will be having a proteinuria present? Uh, guys, uh, uh, ADPKD has enlarged kidneys, but do you have a nephrotic range proteinuria? Do you have nephrotic range proteinuria with respect to autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? Is it a cause of nephrotic syndrome polycystic kidney? I mean, you guys are totally neglecting the laboratory findings. Only thing given in this question is not that the kidneys are enlarged. There are so many reasons for enlarged kidneys. You cannot neglect evidence. You cannot neglect laboratory based evidence given in the question for solving any question. The most important part is the the uh, is the most important part is the the laboratory based evidence given. Sir, देखो minimal chain disease में तो kidney enlarge होती नहीं है. तो minimal chain disease तो वैसी बार हो जाता है. Minimal chain disease में kidney size would be perfectly normal. In diffuse glomerulosclerosis, the word is sclerosis. So, ultimately, due to diabetes, if there is a diffuse glomerulosclerosis, fibrosis will shrink the kidney. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease causes enlarged kidney. That is okay, but nephrotic range proteinuria to nahi hota hai. The correct answer for this one is option number D. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis also has enlarged kidneys. And along with this enlarged kidneys, there would also be a nephrotic range proteinuria. Every time he says, what is the leading reason for development of enlarged kidneys in a patient? So, diabetes mellitus can result in enlarged kidneys. Diabetic nephropathy will cause kidneys to shrink, but diabetes mellitus will cause enlarged kidneys. Then is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Then is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which can cause enlarged kidneys bilaterally. I am talking about bilaterally enlarged kidneys. The fourth reason why kidneys can be enlarged bilaterally is amyloidosis. The four must know reasons. Obviously, bilateral hydronephrosis can be a possibility, but that would change the perspective into surgical domain that we are talking about stones in the bilateral ureter that will cause a bilateral hydronephrosis. So, I will not focus on five, but these first four are a must know for you. Bilaterally enlarged kidneys are seen in diabetes, polycystic kidney, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and amyloidosis. And in these, uh, the ones that are marked here, these are the ones where you could be having nephrotic syndrome manifestations. Diabetes mellitus can cause secondary nephrotic syndrome, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, amyloidosis, that is where nephrotic range proteinuria can be present. The ones where I put the star mark here, the ones where I put the star mark are the ones where nephrotic range proteinuria can be seen along with the enlargement of the kidneys in the patient. The correct answer for this one is option number D, which is the leading cause, leading cause of development of uh, proteinuria which is the leading cause of development of uh, uh, okay the question that is coming up is uh, proteinuria is more than 3.5 grams so 
uh, yes guys a uh, couple of doctors have come up with this query and it's a genuine query but it tells me that you have to listen to me with lots of care which is that there are two definitions of nephrotic syndrome one is more than 3.5 grams per day and the second definition is good that you have asked up this question the second is more than 2 grams per gram of urinary creatinine these are two separate expressions both of them mean the same both of these are nephrotic range proteinuria the difference between the two is here you will have to go in for a 24 hour collection here you have to go in for a 24 hour collection and collecting urine for 24 hours is a big hassle that if you tell the patient to urinate into a bottle to your bottle mein urine pass karna bahut hi matlab you know it's 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 cumbersome a lot of people would say i went to the bathroom pressure zyada feel ho raha tha to i urinated in the toilet seat i forgot ki bottle mein urine pass karna to 24 hour collection ho hi nahi pata there are two definitions of nephrotic syndrome guys good that you have asked this i'm really happy that you've asked this query nephrotic syndrome has two definitions and in mcq he will deliberately give you this one the one that i mentioned more than 2 gram per gram of urinary creatinine is the spot sample and more than 3.5 grams is a 24 hour collection so both definitions are the ones which are to be studied by you cool with respect to children minimal chain disease for adults it's fsgs where you have enlarged kidneys present okay let's get sorted for the next one uh, a surgical question coming up here and the reason why we are doing these questions today is because i want you to be able to jump from one subject to another that capability comes only subsequently subsequently when you are gonna be you know doing multiple subjects you know you could be doing two subjects in a day okay ji waiting for answers here which of the following is not correct about one of the common uh, urethral malformations that is hypospadias as the name suggests hypospadias there is gonna be hypo matlab niche so iska jo urethra ko opening hai tip of the penis pe nahi hai it could be glandular it could be coronal distal penile i mean it could be penoscrotal when he will urinate i mean this particular chap this particular child bachpan se hi hai isko to तो मदर ये बोलेगी दैट इसका जो पेनिस के नीचे का स्किन है दैट विल बिकम इनफ्लेम्ड एंड रेड बिकॉज द चाइल्ड विल डेवलप अमोनिया कल डर्माटाइटिस बिकॉज जैसे मदर ने इसको डायपर डायपर पहना दिया लाइक दिस मदर शी इज नॉट अ डॉक्टर सो शी इज नॉट रियलाइजिंग दैट द यूरेथ्रा ऑफ द बेबी इज ओपनिंग नीचे so she just puts up a diaper as people will do and when she will remove the diaper she will say that you know the uh, my child is having some kind of a rash she will call it a diaper rash diaper rash jo hoti hai wo groin mein hoti hai diaper rash is gonna be in the groin and here the rash is gonna be in the inferior surface of the penis and over the scrotum of the child so a lot of time i mean ammoniacal uh, dermatitis would be the initial presentation which mother will say diaper rash and that is when when you evaluate that you will be able to find that okay this is a hypospadias case this is the leading malformation of the urethra one of the common sites is proximal to the glans penis so that's okay i mean it's either good glans penis or it's gonna be coronal i mean uh, it's gonna be as close as possible uh, to the normal area i mean the normal area would be the tip of the penis so most of the time the malformation will be a little closer to the normal site uh, cordy would mean there would be a curvature in the penis so that's understandable but uh, we are not going to go in for a circumcision as somebody mentioned in the in the uh, 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 in the chat command because if we do circumcision then we lose that valuable skin that will be useful for reconstruction i mean we need to do reconstruction so we need skin for reconstruction purposes and uh, uh, we would not be doing a early early circumcision in these patients so the correct answer for this particular question is option number d it is that if you remove the if you do a circumcision like in some community or like in jews you know after after the birth of the baby they might be doing a circumcision so you will tell them okay don't do this because uh, we would like to do a surgical repair procedure subsequently for the reconstruction purposes we would require the skin so we are sorted for 21 answer is d we pump to 22 which bone does not form the wrist joint of the patient copulation means uh, sexual intercourse <laughs> come on <laughs> are you testing me <laughs> which bone does not form the wrist joint yes guys waiting for the answer for question number 22 एकदम से साइलेंस हो गया यार मेरा चैट कमेंट स्लो हो गया 
<laughs> which bone does not form the wrist joint of the patient yes it would be the ulna of the patient that would not be forming the wrist joint and uh, because of the radio ulnar i mean there's an articular disc present and this articular disc would be preventing uh, uh, the the communication of the ulna with the bones it's the scaphoid lunate and the trichuterum that would be uh, associated with the radius bone but it would not be i mean mainly it is the scaphoid and the lunate bone that would be communicating with the radius and there's an articular disc that is present because of which the ulna will be communicating directly the ulna would be communicating directly with the radius but it would not be forming a communication with the wrist joint. So Allah is not a part of the wrist joint anyway. Okay, another easy question. Uh, paper 1 may sir, anatomy is going to be there for at least uh, at least 20 MCQs and I want you to get all 20 to 20 correct. Please focus on anatomy. If you have not read it, at least FMG solutions case starting ke jo 500 MCQs. Hai. Unko kar lo. Abhi bhi time. 100 a day, try to do 500 of them because anatomy perspective is the point uh, of the anatomy perspective is is gonna be make or break anatomy is the first hour anatomy is gonna build up your confidence to thoda sa focus kar lena agle kuch dino mein which artery is not a branch of the internal carotid artery absolutely it it is facial artery so <laughs> very deep knowledge facial artery and then in your exam they have asked regarding the branches of the external carotid artery the branches of the external carotid artery though there are lot of mnemonics for it can you tell me the first branch of the external carotid artery yes guys branches of the external carotid artery yeah there are multiple you know it would be like uh, I mean there are multiple mnemonics for it can I have the answer for uh, uh, which is the first branch of the I think it's given already but still first branch of the external carotid artery the mnemonic is some ana anatomists like to freak out uh, poor medical students it's like that right I think the mnemonic there is like that sir sara karna hai strange uh, you have to do the entire thing ulta chalna uh, do it from uh, pale retina se padna you know pale retina karna retina se reverse jana cornea conjunctiva pe time lagaoge aur uh, cataract pe jaake taakat khatam ho jati and it is retina se reverse jana crao crvo to retina se upar jana wo reverse mein jana then vitreous chamber then the lens then the cornea conjunctiva that's how yes the first branch is obviously the superior thyroid artery guys they just simply put up a question what is the first branch of external carotid artery the mnemonic is some anatomists like to freak out poor medical students uh, i am not a big fan of mnemonics so i i just mentioned it verbally i did not decide to write it but then these are like couple of uh, uh, branches that you need to remember for external carotid artery and they love to ask about branches of internal carotid and external carotid for internal carotid artery i've drawn a diagram even the anatomist has talked about it but even in my neurology section i've drawn the circle of willis i've described the branches uh, anterior cerebral middle cerebral artery I've, I've tried to make it clinical there by describing what kind of stroke will occur which part of the brain will be involved with respect to the involvement of which uh, which branch per se so you are requested to either use an rr or go through the main video stroke where you would be able to pick up uh, the aspect related to uh, the branches of the internal carotid artery so let's do 24 guys which of the following is a free floating structure inside the cavernous sinus i have given the diagram here also so that you can just remember the nerves which are present and uh, i think from the diagram itself the answer is very much visible because you are having some structural support for 3 4 5 but one that is just adjacent to the internal carotid artery the one that is just adjacent to the this is the internal carotid artery which you can pick up so just adjacent to the internal carotid artery is the sixth cranial nerve in the patient which would be a free floating structure the correct answer for this one is option number d and uh, most of the time in the exam they are gonna be uh, asking about cavernous sinus thrombosis also cst the clinical presentation of cavernous sinus thrombosis would be that this person would be having infection in the dangerous area of the face the dangerous area of the face as you all know would be that this particular patient could be having a pustule 
लाइक ये टीनेजर है इसको पस्ट्यूल हुआ डेंजरस एरिया ऑफ द फेस में डेंजरस एरिया ऑफ द फेस वुड बी दिस पर्टिकुलर एरिया दैट इज द फिल्ट्रम एंड द अपर लिप एंड द लोअर पार्ट ऑफ द एल आई नजाय सो द पर्सन इज हैविंग इन्फेक्शन इन द डेंजरस एरिया ऑफ द फेस एंड इसको ये जो पस्ट्यूल हुआ इज प्रेसिंग ऑन दैट पस्ट्यूल एंड देन द इन्फेक्शन इज गोइंग रेट्रोग्रेडली बिकॉज यहाँ पर जो वेन्स होती हैं वो वेल्वलेस वेन्स होती हैं सो द इन्फेक्शन विल गो रेट्रोग्रेडली to the cavernous sinus of the patient and cavernous sinus is just anterior to the eyeball so the clinical presentation would be that this particular chap who had some infection on the dangerous area of the face would be having fever and then would be having a sudden onset he wakes up with a unilateral proptosis every time you read about fever with unilateral proptosis in a patient it can be bilateral also because the two cavernous sinuses would be communicating with each other so subsequently in this patient you could be having a bilateral proptosis as well but the point is there is a retrograde infection that is being transmitted in this particular case post infection developing in the dangerous area of the face every time you read about fever with unilateral proptosis it is cavernous sinus thrombosis which is always to be kept in mind and the craniosynovitis that can be involved then are 3 4 5 and 6 we sorted for 24 let's do uh, 25 quickly what would be the key muscle of the neck yes these are relatively easier ones and would help you in paper number 1 the key muscle of the neck would be the one that would help you in turning your neck that would be sternocleidomastoid so i think 25 is relatively a easier one the correct answer for this one is option number d Let's move on to 26, which is the narrowest part of the urethra. Yep, yep. We are sorted for 25. Cool. Great answers. So look, it's it's gonna be a mixed bag. It's it's gonna be like uh, easy ones and difficult ones mixed up. I'm just doing some markings here. Uh, this dilated part of the male urethra is what is called as navicular fossa. And uh, then we're gonna be having uh, prostatic urethra. that's where the copper glands are going to be and then we going to have a membranous urethra and the question is saying which is the narrowest part of the urethra yes guys i'm waiting for answer a uh, narrowest part of the urethra and i am getting a predominantly b as an answer that is membranous urethra uh, membranous urethra is the least dilatable part of the urethra by least dilatable i mean that it can be damaged during instrumentation like if a doctor is putting a inappropriately large foley catheter then there can be a damage in the while the doctor is putting a foley catheter it can be damaged least dilatable is not same as the narrowest part of the urethra the mcq is saying what is the narrowest part of the urethra the answer is not b there are two separate mcqs one is the least dilatable part of the urethra the second one is prostatic to both wider sir so that cannot be the answer the correct answer for this one is option number d external urethral orifice is the narrowest part of the urethra the correct answer is not b guys for b the mcq will say which is gonna be which is gonna be okay vishnu i'll try to do that in a subsequent session where i'll have diagrams for the uh i got your point that manhole accident and the injuries to the base of the penis do it's well explained in fmg solutions but still i'll try to do that so i'll explain guys the answer to this mcq is external urinary meatus it's the external urethral orifice which is going to be the least least uh, uh it's the narrowest part of the urethra so there are two separate mcq statements which i want you to be aware of and both do not mean the same this is a very common mistake that i've seen people doing tabhi main bol raha hu ki aapko abhi bhi you you have time at your disposal fmg solutions ke shuru ke 500 jo anatomy ke question hai unko ek bar hi kar lo so that you will be understanding the psychology of the examiner relatively better i know you are using lot of apps and all apps are good so wo sab conceptual conceptual bol ke bahut kuch bol jate hain बट कोई बताता नहीं है कि कंसेप्ट क्या है ना <laughs> चलो आई नॉट गेट इनटू दैट द पॉइंट इज सर सोल्यूशन का जो एक्सप्लेनेशन है ना उसको पढ़ लेना यू विल गेट अ लॉट ऑफ इनसाइड इनटू द डेटा और मैं लास्ट मोमेंट में क्यों बोल रहा हूँ उसको करने के लिए बिकॉज आपको थोड़ा ओरिएंटेशन मिल जाएगा ऑप्शन को रूल आउट करने का सो आई एम नॉट सेंग कि पूरा करो आई एम नॉट सेंग कि मेडिसिन मैं बोल सकता था यार मेडिसिन करो सर्जरी करो मैं बोल रहा हूँ अनाटमी वाला आप पाँच सौ एम से क्यों करो अगले तीन या चार दिन में हंड्रेड पर डे के बेसिस पे तो आपको एक्सप्लेनेशन पार्ट फटाफट फटफट पढ़ना है 
and then you know go, go down to the answer so that you get an orientation into how to rule out the options we sorted for 26 guys so we just have three more to do yes with explanation doctor with explanation no without explanation doctor sahab kaise hoga i mean you know aise to answer atne se to kuch nahi hoga na jaise main aapko bata raha hu na aise hi padhna hai fast ki least least dilatable or narrowest same nahi hota haan ji doctor sahab six se karo kisi se bhi karo karo what is the leading hereditary cause of development of stroke in a patient sir ki ka to mujhe pata nahi hai but ye hai ki at least it provides you a ready reckoner for that that direction ना बाकी तो आप एजेंट लोगो यू यू गाइस कैन मैनेज सब्सिक्वेंटली यू हैव टू डू क्लिनिकल पैटर्न क्वेश्चन 200 ही तो है यार लोगो लड़कों ने चार चार पांच पांच बार कर रखे हैं अब तो मैं क्वेश्चन अगर पूछ लूं ना वो वाला तो वो पहले आंसर बोल देते हैं कि सर ये तो आता है हमारे को यस गाइस व्हिच इज द लीडिंग हेरिडिटरी कॉज ऑफ डेवलपमेंट ऑफ स्ट्रोक इन अ पेशेंट हेरिडिटरी मतलब उसके फादर को भी स्ट्रोक हो गया उसके ग्रैंडफादर को भी स्ट्रोक हो गया सो द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस वन वुड बी ऑप्शन नंबर सी That is uh, good, Rudra. I am happy that you have done it. I hope I may sincerely hope करता हूँ कि फायदा हो. Questions repeat नहीं होते, topics repeat होते. The correct answer for this MCQ is autosomal dominant. It's written as cerebral autosomal dominant. This is a pure hardcore pathology based question for paper one. आपको सिर्फ इसको English से solve करना है. It is cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy. With subcortical infarcts, longish नाम है but यहां पर presentation यही है कि the father had strokes, grandfather also had stroke, so cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. तो वो तो थोड़ा longish हो जाता है but at least what I can request you to remember is that uh, आप इसको autosomal dominant से solve कर सकते हो I mean there would be a family history of stroke present in this patient. नॉच थ्री जीन होता है यहाँ पर एनी वे लेट्स नॉट गेट इनटू द जीन ज्यादा हो जाएगा एटलीस्ट ऑटोजोमल डोमिनेट अभी तो याद करो तो इट विल बिकम रिलेटिव इजियर फॉर यू सो आंसर टू ट्वेंटी सेवन इज ऑप्शन नंबर सी वी मूव टू ट्वेंटी एट व्हाट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन प्राइमरी मलेग्नेंट ट्यूमर ऑफ द हार्ट फिर अनाटमी के पैथोलॉजी से करने वट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन प्राइमरी मलेग्नेंट ट्यूमर ऑफ द हार्ट ये रोना मना है we have to smile and study you have to study with enthusiasm yes man i'm going to learn it am i it's all possible okay most common primary malignant tumor of the heart is rhabdomyosarcoma if the question was with respect to what is going to be a benign tumor of the heart it is going to be a myxoma always have positive vibes and always study in a group which does not talk negative it you always have to talk about okay i have to learn this fact okay this is a new fact i'm learning Don't worry about that. Okay, you know, should I learn new facts? Yeah, doctor, doctor, me every day you learn new new facts only. Big soma is a benign, rhabdomyosarcoma is the sarcoma is the malignant tumor, and overall most common is Mets. Okay, so let's do another one. This guy is a beggar on the road. He's having all these potato man, potato tumors. The potato man is having potato tumors. It's referred as von Recklinghausen disease, which is also written as neurofibromab one (NF1). I'll share a PDF in my Telegram group subsequently, in which in in front of every chromosome, क्या क्या disease होते हैं और given. Though I made that list long back, you know, when I was doing my MBBS, even in our times, what they used to do was they used to ask us. They they'll give us a disease and they'll ask us this disease is related to which chromosome. So I thought, यार ये तो याद ही नहीं हो सकता. ये तो मैं कर ही नहीं पाऊँगा. And I got so frustrated because of that कि फिर मैंने क्या किया कि I I myself sat down और मैं लिखा chromosome वन के कौन कौन सा disease है chromosome टू के कौन से हैं थर्टीन के कौन से हैं फिफ्टीन के कौन से हैं सेवनटीन के कौन से हैं the correct answer for this one is option number is answer is chromosome number seventeen thirteen is a must know for you for Wilson disease fourteen is related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy HOCM in which we read sudden football player running after ball dies suddenly the sudden death in football player वाला question and then it's gonna be chromosome fifteen that's related to Marfan syndrome so I am telling you all this data not that I have written it somewhere it's stored in my brain why because I did the hard work at same stage as you were twenty twenty two twenty three twenty four years of age I think I'm talking to young guys young guns right so all those young guns listening to me I did this and I want you guys to do this also. I'll give you a ready reckoner. I'll post that maybe by tomorrow, the entire list of uh, chromosomes. And I would like you to go through it very thoroughly. I mean, what will you ask? Dr. Sahib, you have to 
he would love to ask you about it yes chromosome 15 is related to genomic imprint in also absolutely right doctor and uh, dr gaming has also mentioned for chromosome 22 for uh, 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 neurofibromatosis 2 that's related to neurofibromas uh, related to acoustic neuromas okay guys so let's hit the last question for today yes supero temporal lens dislocation let's uh, do the last one for today what is the most common site for extra pulmonary tuberculosis the word is extra pulmonary obviously for pulmonary tuberculosis the answer would be different so let's just do this yes prader angel man also you're right yes guys the last one for today waiting for your answers here i got only 10 answers right at the moment uh speedball it's uh, hats off to you you are at least acknowledging that in a in a galat way doesn't matter here sometimes no maybe you had too much of a heavy dinner maybe you did not eat properly maybe you not slept properly there can be multiple reasons evaluate this the most common site of extra pulmonary tuberculosis is gonna be the lymph node it's gonna be cervical lymphadenopathy and these lymph nodes will become bigger 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 and they will burst and then the pus will escape into the tissue spaces in the neck and it would result in development of cold abscess in this patient so for patients who are having cold abscess, it's usually a cervical lymph node that gets involved. The usual site is going to be the tonsil and from the tonsil, the cervical group of lymph node would get involved and will cause manifestations in this patient. So we are sorted with this one. Let's do one more. Okay. That last, last one for today. And then we call it quits for today. Okay. Like, okay, guys, uh, we'll be taking up another session in which I'll be handing the remaining ones. Uh, let's do the last one for today here. Uh, let's test your ECG here and I've discussed this MCQ just uh, recently but in a different way so let's look at uh, uh, the perspectives 25 year old 24 year old lady is admitted with fluttering sensation in the chest with disease spells uh, fluttering sensation means there are palpitations uh, sir uh, VK vlogs uh, the, uh, the telegram group is uh, mentioned in the description of this video I mean if you click on this video there's a description of the video in that the telegram link is given chalo ji aage chalte uh, karenge, karenge, Rao. We'll be doing ABGs. I need to take more sessions, sir. Itni jaldi to nahi kara sakta na. I have to focus and do subsequent aspects. Chalo ji. Palpitations are present in this lady. She's had multiple episodes. Heart rate is 150. Blood pressure is on the lower side. And he's giving you a perspective in this case where you can notice that it's a narrow QRS tachycardia with ST depression with absent P waves. Yes, this is a PSVT. The reason why we are calling it a PSVT is because simple si baat hai, isme narrow complex, it's a narrow QRS complex which is present here. Every time you read a narrow QRS complex, you know the fact that he's going to talk about a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. The RR interval of this patient is dramatically, you know, this is going to be a proxy. If I just mark it here, this is going to be much much faster i mean something like maybe 1.5 large square so the heart rate of this patient is going up to 200 though in the question it is mentioned i think 150 only but the heart the tachyarrhythmia has accelerated and uh, in this particular question uh, the answer will change guys uh, ocular massage to karte nahi hai aaj kal. yes guys i'm waiting for answer i mean mujhe alag -alag answer mil rahe psvt hai to psvt ke patient mein मैं तो कहता हूं ईसीजी नहीं भी आती फिर भी सॉल्व हो जाएगा क्वेश्चन एनी टैकेरिथमिया एमसीक्यू जिसमें ऐसा फास्ट हार्ट रेट दे रखा है इफ बीपी इज अनरिकॉर्डेबल तो क्या करते हैं अगर किसी भी मैं कहता हूं आपको ईसीजी पढ़ना नहीं आता सपोज आपको नहीं पता ये पीएसवीटी आप फिर भी क्वेश्चन सॉल्व कर लोगे इन एनी टैकेरिथमिया इफ यू कैन जस्ट पिक अप अ टैकेकार्डिया सर वो तो मुश्किल नहीं है ना टैकेकार्डिया तो आरआर इंटरवल से निकालना है 300 डिवाइडेड बाय आरआर इंटरवल if you can just pick up tachyarrhythmia with a crushing BP, you are not going to give drugs in the patient. The answer would be given as cardioversion in the patient. Suppose in this MCQ, the blood vessel or blood pressure was given to be normal. Suppose this BP of the patient is 110 by 70. Any time in the exam, if the systolic blood pressure is more than 90 millimeter of mercury, answer is adenosine. Stable patient होता है, adenosine देते हैं, prevention के लिए देते हैं, virapa mil. वो मैं next pattern में तो जा ही नहीं रहा, जो मैंने question discuss किया था, I mean I had discussed a version of this question from NEET PG perspective, that was where the answer was virapa mil, I'm not even getting into that. In FMG exam, the question will be simple and straightforward, that would be cardioversion. Cardioversion is synchronized doctor. Cardioversion is synchronized DC shock. 
आपको सिर्फ इतना याद रखना है सिर्फ इतना याद रखना है कोई भी टैके रिदमिया दे दे बीपी क्रैश कर रहा है एट्रल फेबरेशन आंसर कर देना एक को छोड़ के सॉरी डीसी शॉक आंसर करना कार्डियो वर्जन एक को छोड़ के एट्रल फेबरेशन इन एट्रल फेबरेशन वी फर्स्ट हैव टू गो इन फॉर एंटी कोगुलेशन रेट कंट्रोल एंटी कोगुलेशन देन केमिकल कार्डियो वर्जन देन इलेक्ट्रिकल कार्डियो वर्जन एक्सेप्ट फॉर एट्रल फेबरेशन जिसमें एबसेंट पी वेव होते हैं इन ऑल अदर टैके रिदमिया बीपी इज क्रशिंग आंसर इज सीधा आर डीसी शॉक टू बी गिवन दैट इज सिंकरनाइज डीसी शॉक and the only time you are supposed to answer defibrillation the only time you are supposed to answer defibrillation is for pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation simple to hai yaar isme zyada hi fi cheeze karni nahi hai isko rocket science nahi banana hai isko just simple straight forward facts banane hai ke bhai question nikalna chahiye it is simply that you know we are not going to get into hi fi things we are not going to hame cardiologist thodi na banna hai we have to just keep things simple and straight forward so we are done for today guys it was a great uh, session interacting with you young guns today and uh, i'll be back sir i'll be back with more discussion and uh, we'll we'll take care of other, multiple other aspects uh, subsequently so god bless you take care and uh, uh, for uh, any queries you can send me email at my email id that's marwa medicine at uh, gmail.com and the other things that i've discussed in the session i would like you to practice them again at uh, two uh, uh, at 2x i mean if you can listen to this at 2x i think uh, this would help you guys this would help you in a sense that this would help you cover multiple aspects so black panther I, it will be updated on youtube soon the the discussion and the date for the video will come up so i'll take care of i'll take care of it yes guys you will do all the mehnat and you will be doing i'll mention guys thoda sa time do na thoda planning organization mein time lagta hai so good night god bless you